Good afternoon to everyone. Magandang hapon sa lahat. Uh, on behalf of Solutions Plus team, I am pleased to welcome you all to the day two of the PASIC City uh, training on electric mobility. So this is also co-organized with PASIC City Transport Office, which is a Solutions Plus consortium partner. Some of them have already joined us uh, in, in today's session. This session, as you would notice, uh, is run as a Zoom meeting. So as opposed to a Zoom webinar, uh, you are also open to uh, uh, present your interventions later on verbally. So we'll start off our session with a basic housekeeping. Uh, first note, uh, first please note that the session is uh, being recorded. Uh, but the recording and the presentations will later on be available for you uh, afterward, after the session has ended. Uh, and we will put that all in the Solutions Plus project website. We have also muted everyone by default, but if you would like to raise your questions or elaborate them verbally during the discussions, Please let the co-host know uh, or, or raise your hand if you are able to, so we can also unmute you. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please submit them via the chat box. You're welcome to use the chat box uh, throughout the session for your comments and your questions. So this is going to be somewhat bilingual in some sessions. I will try to uh, foster a bit more welcoming environment for discussions uh, today. So it's the same as yesterday if you have been able to join us uh, yesterday. My name is Kathleen and I am representing Clean Air Asia and we are also a Solutions Plus project partner. Uh, if you are just joining us today, welcome to our sessions and welcome to the training. We will first provide you an overview of the project and initiatives to help you uh, to help set the context. So we are working with uh, PASIC Transport, uh, PASIC City, uh, specifically the PASIC Transport Office. So PASIC City, uh, many of us are familiar. Uh, it's one of the most proactive cities in terms of uh, embracing and, and testing measures towards sustainable mobility. So it's one of the first cities to create an office th uh, that is dedicated to transport planning so that the, they're actually called the PASIG uh, City Transport Development and Management Office. So their focus is not just on traffic management, but really to lead, the, uh, ensure, lead and ensure the sustainable mobility in the city. So they have also recently created a steering committee on electric mobility. So it, it's the uh, it's probably the first of its kind in the Philippines. So you would see that on the screen, the executive order that has been signed by the mayor. Um, in this process, in this project, uh, you, uh, as I go through the, the project, the pilot testing, the innovations that we're testing, um, we'd like to note that we're not only pilot testing uh, the innovations or the solutions like uh, e-vehicles. We're also uh, learning in this process how to best facilitate uh, the, the the stakeholder engagement, uh, the the development itself of the the interventions, uh, and make an impact also on the institutional structure and the policies. So this is the uh, the e mobility steering committee recently signed, um, and that includes as you would see, uh, different LGU local government unit offices um, that are now tasked to lead the planning. Uh, and the implementation of e-mobility in the city. So you have here the agencies in charge of uh, government fleets, like the Office of the General Services. Um, you also have a city uh, health office, a city environment, uh, city planning, and city engineering. So note that uh, the tiers are in terms of uh, are organized in such a way that you know they're organized according to the level of engagement um, because it's anchored uh, highly on the transport planning, ensuring a public health and uh, uh, an improvement in air quality. Um, the transport is working alongside a city environment and the city health department, um, especially on gathering the data and uh, making uh, and developing the baseline information about the city. So we also have here in the steering committee, the public transport three-wheeler stakeholders uh, like, like the Toro, because in the Philippines, the three-wheelers three are under the, the city. So jeepneys and buses are not. There are also other city level ordinances uh, and directives that are supporting electric mobility, like the, uh, the tricycle upgrading ordinance. Um, that's also envisaged to be updated to accelerate the shift to e-mobility. Several pilots are also ongoing and have been drilled out, such as the, uh, the DOE e-trikes. Uh, a lot of e e three-wheeler pilots have been um, tested in different cities in the Philippines. 
DOT, the Department of Transportation, uh, together with UNDP, they're also uh, co-implementing a project. And one of the pilot is also in Pasig City. So that covers several aspects uh, and several uh, interventions towards low carbon mobility. We are also working with, uh, with PASIC together with UNEP, which is also a Solutions Plus Consortium partner and is also joining us today. Uh, but on this regard, with support from the International Climate Initiative or, or ikr uh, in testing electric two and three wheelers. So the green vehicles that you see on the screen, that is, uh, those are the units that are with the Philippine Postal Corporation and we are testing that for mail and parcel delivery. So a lot of things are, uh, a lot of learnings that are, uh, uh, are coming out of this, especially because you know Philippine Postal Corporation, they're all also a government-owned and controlled corporation. So um, the process, uh, the facilitation is also quite different from that arena. So this pilot was launched uh, back in November uh, 2019, pre-pandemic. That was expected to commence in, in March 2020, uh, but it has since then been used by the city for a variety of pr purpose. Uh, given the local needs uh, amid the pandemic. So that will continue to be enhanced also and uh, scaled up. We work on uh, vehicle concepts, uh, we work on three areas. So vehicle concept that's focused on uh, energy efficient vehicles, uh, shared logistics use cases are being explored now for Pasig City. Uh, this is not just happening in Pasig City, as you will see later on, we're also testing it in, in other solutions plus partner cities like Hanoi. We're testing uh, electric scooter sharing. Um, so we also look at uh, the second one is um, the operations. So we're looking at the application of uh, innovative, uh, innovative applications and business models. We are also testing the integration as uh, concepts in this pilot. Uh, so for policy and the uh, technologies, the, the learnings, uh, you know, this is a fairly new technology, a fairly new solution. Even if the Philippines has been piloting uh, the e-mobility for like over a decade now, uh, there's still need to uh, foster and facilitate that peer-to-peer -peer exchange. And this is where this map uh, comes in. So uh, PASIC joins uh, a global e-mobility platform and community and that's also being set up by uh, uh, both the EU, European Union funded Solutions Plus project, and also the UNEP and IEA uh, under the Global Environment Facility. Uh, as I mentioned, Solutions Plus is supported by the EU and it brings together almost 50 partners uh, from the city, uh, the network, uh, city networks, and also academia, academic and research institutions, uh, who are all working on electric mobility solutions and are testing different innovations. So for, as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, having a specific look at the shared mobility uh, solutions. Together, there uh, is now support for you know, 50 countries globally on taking up uh, those kinds of solutions. But beyond the global exchange, uh, next slide, uh, we are uh, also highlighting here uh, the depth and the breadth of the cooperation uh, that is needed from various stakeholders within even the Philippines. So while we are pursuing these activities, we are working with a, a lot of stakeholder groups uh, for which our level of engagement is summarized on the screen. Uh, we are working directly with uh, several partners. Um, for example, uh, uh, of course, the Solutions Plus Consortium partners like the City Transport Office, uh, the City's Office of the General Services. They have oversight over the city fleets uh, and other assets. We are also, uh, we also have our local industry partner, Tojo Motors and the La Salle University uh, and Philippine Postal Corporation or Philpos. So they are one of uh, Pasig, city, uh, Pasig City's partners in testing the e-mobility solutions. But we also have uh, stakeholders that we are continuing uh, to consult. First off, we have the, what I mentioned earlier, the 10 member, uh, 10 agency member electric mobility steering committee and that's comprised of uh, uh, various uh, LGU offices and in the developing the pilot we are also consulting uh, many SMEs, many enterprises uh, as well as the current and potential users of EVs. Uh, we also consult the national government agencies to ensure alignment in initiatives. Uh, we also pursue informing uh, relevant stakeholders such as those with interventions 
in Pasig City or generally in the Philippines. So we are pursuing a roundtable discussions and holding such uh, um, dialogues uh, regularly. So not only for information purposes, but we also want to ensure that we capture uh, cooperation uh, opportunities and to reduce uh, and to avoid duplication of efforts. So with that, uh, let us briefly talk about our session this week. So yesterday we had the chance to have a, a live demo uh, about the EV parts and care. So that was live from Santa Rosa Laguna and we had a more hybrid approach with some of the, the participants joining us from uh, Pasig City on site. Uh, there were about 20 or so people uh, joining us from there. Um, and we also had a Zoom session. Tomorrow, uh, we will hear about uh, charging. And on Friday, we will look at various applications of uh, electric mobility. Specifically, we'll look at public e three wheelers or, or e trikes, uh, shared uh, mobility devices uh, or private use uh, of smaller EVs, and also enterprises. Uh, for today, and next slide, uh, that would be about uh, more on the policy tools to balance access and safety. So first we'll uh, have, uh, we'll hear from Alvin from Wuppertal Institute about the uh, immobility policy tools for local authorities. Then we'll have Bert from UNEP who will go through uh, briefly the ASEAN EV standards and guidelines. They will also look at the case of Malaysia. What are the regulations? Uh, what were the considerations? Uh, what was the process when the guidelines were being crafted there? So uh, Dr. Horizon is joining us uh, from Malaysia today. Uh, then we'll also hear about the, the India case of India. Uh, what were the measures that they used there to promote e-mobility? So we'll look at the, uh, the alignment of the national and the state uh, interventions. Uh, then we'll uh, look at the Philippine case. So in the absence of uh, land transport office, unfortunately, they're not able to join us today, uh, but I am happy to go through the Philippine regulations for our session discussion today. So with that, um, I think we can first go to uh, a one survey uh, to talk about, uh, to understand who is in the room. Give us an idea of the type of a, uh, organization you are representing. Nice. So for those just joining us, um, and just give us an idea if uh, you can go to slido.com and type in the event code 815058. And just give us an insight like, uh, are you from the national government? Are you from an international uh, uh, international organization uh, or local government? Are you representing a research, uh, an academic institution? Or are you coming from a startup or private sector, SMEs, perhaps operating a, an EV fleet also? Most can also give us that. So we have a lot of options. Uh, we have a lot of people joining us from the different LGUs. Good. So um, it's good to know that there are a lot of uh, LGUs. So I, I saw in some of the Zoom uh, names uh, we have from different uh, local government units. Um, so while you're waiting for the others to answer the slide though, you could also uh, rename your Zoom if you would like to put your, um, your city in your Zoom name. Okay, so we can, we can stop with the slide first and I'll introduce the Alvin first for the first presentation. And so Alvin uh, is going to tell us a bit more uh, about the, the policy tools for uh, local authorities. So Alvin is with Wuppertal Institute and he's leading the, the organization leading the Solutions Plus project. Um, and he's been working for over a decade on projects related to sustainable transport in developing countries, uh, uh, climate mitigation and co-benefit analysis for 
transport initiatives. So he has had the chance uh, in his extensive uh, work experience uh, to work with both the national and the local government. So we're looking forward to this presentation on the policy tools for local authorities. Thank you. Magandang, magandang umaga, magandang tanghali. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alvin. And I'll be giving you um, a presentation on um, the e-mobility policy tools for local authorities. I think just to give you a background, when we were co-designing the, the, the training sessions with the, our counterparts, our partners there at the, uh, from, from, from Pasig City, I think this was one of the um, questions that they've had. Like, what can the local governments do in relation to the, the functions and the powers that are given to them? Um, siguro po, uh, magtataglish din ako today. Um, I, I'll try to, to, to concentrate, highlight those uh, tools that um, probably the, the local governments can explore directly. But uh, I've also included slides on those relevant, uh, let's say, topics, themes um, that probably the local governments uh, would need to know uh, to better appreciate the, the mechanics. Um, para din po siguro um, to, to, to be able to know what you can, um, what you can uh, parang request no? siguro when, when talking to different sectors from the national government and maybe also from, from the private sector. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, so in terms of the outline, I'll be going through four different types of, uh, of uh, policy tools uh, relating to e-mobility. So firstly, regula regulations or uh, legal measures. And the second one is on financial measures. The third one, communications. And the fourth one is more on organizational level. So from the standpoint, for example, of the units themselves, the local government units. Um, so yeah, Kathleen has uh, discussed earlier, so we're uh, representing the Solutions Plus project um, in, in the delivery of these uh, training sessions. Um, this is a global project that is being supported by the uh, European Commission that would run up to 2023, and we're working with uh, 10 different cities globally in terms of um, testing innovations, as well as uh, looking at uh, the supporting mechanisms for accelerating e-mobility. Siguro po, just to put it, everything into context, um, when we talk about e-mobility, we want to put this under the broader context um, of uh, social technical systems. So hindi lang po tayo uh, tumitingin ng e-vehicles on the ground. Um, pero it's really about integrating um, the concept of e-mobility within a wider system na composed of people, technology, infrastructure, processes, we look at goals, we look at culture, and we look at the different aspects of uh, sustainable mobility in general. Um, in relation to the, to the general topic of the session, um, I think that really the priorities um, and the challenges and priorities relating to the current uh, proliferation on e-vehicles um, safety, ensuring um, also um, increased access for people who would want to increase their uh, mobility, increase access. So in terms um, of the Philippine context, uh, siguro may kita niyo mamaya, marami rin tayong slides on uh, mga light uh, electric vehicles. And then uh, um, Bert Fabian from UNEP would also be focusing on the guidelines uh, for uh, two and three wheelers in South Asia. And Dr. Horizon would probably also uh, uh, go deeper um, into this context for the Malaysian uh, experience. No? So maraming financial advantages yung mga maliliit na electric vehicles natin, mas mura. Um, operational advantages, mas mabilis. Um, for example, it, it compared kung magkocommute ka using the jeepney or kung maglalakad ka. So merong increased access, merong increased mobility, better commuting experience depending sa alternatives natin. Um, in terms of technological advantage, um, these vehicles being electric, um, less urban pollution. Um, but uh, in reality, there are challenges uh, due to the lack of clarity. So there are safety concerns, environmental concerns. What will happen to the batteries afterwards, for example? Or what are the standards that na ensure um, the system per se that all of the vehicles would be uh, safe, would be environmentally sustainable? Um, and lahat na to, pag kina, pag, when we do a certain um, um, analysis, no? when we evaluate all these things, do we really benefit, do we really reap the, the, the benefits that these uh, vehicles might offer? 
So again, I've mentioned uh, earlier, we have uh, legal, regulatory, financial, communication, and organizational um, uh, policy tools that we can use. So let me just go through the regulatory instruments first. So what I'll try to do, um, just tell you stories about um, experiences globally. Uh, we have EU experiences from also from, from North America, a couple from, from Asia. Um, so there are a lot of uh, different uh, regulatory instruments. It could be in terms of uh, legal requirements and standards, be in terms of, uh, you know, relating to, to the charging stations, relating to the, uh, the infrastructure, parking regulations, low emission zones, access to urban areas. I'll be explaining some of these things later. Zoning and building codes, permitting rules and guidelines. So in terms of, uh, let's just go to the basics in terms of regulating the equipment itself, like, like for example, the e-vehicles. Um, um, for example, in the EU, <clears throat> and this particular, let's say, policy or regulatory framework that they've um, adopted since 2009. It's based on environmental performance standards and the, the whole vehicle fleet would be moving towards stricter um, environmental standards, for example, CO2 emissions. In terms of the Philippines, um, UNEP, Cleaner Asia, um, the DOE has been working on um, fuel economy standards, for example, for vehicles. And uh, we do hope na we'll progress to as we move forward into the future. Um, there are other things that we can consider in terms of uh, regulation of the equipment. So, for example, in terms of e-scooters, shared e-scooters, po, no? wala pa, I think, sa Philippines tayo. Um, but uh, maybe in, in the near future, we will see some, um, some of these uh, systems. Um, it could be in terms of um, looking at the scooters themselves, looking at identification. Um, looking at uh, um, providing information in terms of the proper operations, parking rules, at fees, paglagay po ng mga accessories, front and rear light requirements, reflector requirements, um, tamper resistance hardware, locking mechanisms, GPS uh, equipment, cable um, equipment, saka compliance standards. Uh, this also might uh, be relevant for, let's say, yung mga shared um, light uh, um, pedal assist or, or power assisted pedal bikes. So meron ding regulations regarding to the users. Um, sino ba yung gumagamit ng mga sasakyan na to? So we can see uh, there are different um, you know, rules that are being adopted in terms of age restrictions, in terms of uh, using helmets um, in relation to occupancy. So for example, again, for, for the scooters, only one person per vehicle during operations. Or no using of uh, cell phones while using it um, and or holding of packages um, also yielding to pedestrians so uh, kailangan um, may priority pa rin yung pedestrians no, sa, sa paggamit and adherence to speed limits um, ito naman po a combination of equipment usage and users just an example this is from the Netherlands um, and um, as you can see here, this is for their um, parang ano, um, power assisted bikes. So there are speed limits depending on the type of road that they are operating on. Um, they require um, that, the, that the, the pedelec has a license plate attached to it. So meron ding mga requirements in terms of the users. So again, like at least 16 years old, it has to have a license, um, wear appropriate helmets have to have civil liability insurance um, and registration certificate um, every time that they use it. Um, this is particularly important for these types of, uh, of bikes uh, because they are, kumbaga, the, the, the way they are built, they can um, um, move faster and essentially they pose some increased level of uh, safety concerns, for example, uh, for, uh, for example, for, for pedestrians. No? Um, same with Singapore, very similar yung kanilang um, pag-adopt uh, ng, ng regulations with regards to power-assisted bicycles. So yung kanilang definition, um, the, the bicycles uh, maximum speed of 25 kilometers per hour, 200 watts uh, maximum power output. Um, and they require certain requirements for the, for the bikes themselves. And maximum weight should not uh, exceed 20 uh, kg. And modifications to the bed, uh, pedal assisted bikes um, are not uh, are prohibited. So they, they have a long list of this. I, um, when once you receive the presentation files, we put the, the sources as well, so you can uh, also explore uh, in detail yung mga pinapakita namin today. 
Um, and then later, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but uh, of UNEP will be uh, going through in detail yung mga guidelines and uh, recommendations for, for uh, uh, two and three wheeler guidelines for Southeast Asia. I won't go through this because uh, Bert would be discussing this in detail. So we've gone through, you know, the vehicles, um, equipment, uh, usage. Let's go through some, some regulations um, in relation to um, providing access to these types of vehicles. Um, isa po tinatawag natin yung low emission zones. Um, one can probably think of this as um, kumbaga, restricting access for certain types of, uh, of uh, vehicles depending on their environmental performance standards. In a way, we do have a certain concept of this in the Philippines, yung mga um, smoke-free zones, for example. I remember dun sa Pasig, city tricycle uh, upgrading ordinance i think 2016 there was a provision there for establishing um smoke free zones and uh, noise uh, free zones but for this one for example um, um what i'm showing here is the one in london uh, so um these are the types of vehicles that are being affected so if if you your vehicle would be a, if, of a certain age uh, you would be restricted in terms of entering uh, certain parts of the city. And then it, it would require you to register to the system. And if you would, you know, an, um, essentially you would actually need to travel, you need to pay a certain amount for being in that zone. And very similarly, this is the one um, that is uh, um, being implemented in Amsterdam. So they've um, had the low emission zones um, but they, um, they are moving towards what they call the zero emission zone. Um, kung makita niyo po dito, they, they um, divided the city into the three dis different zones, the center, um, this uh, inner circle here, and the wider area. And they are adopting different, um, let's say, um, compliance mechanisms for each of the zone, depending on the type of vehicle, depending on the uh, emission standards. Um, and then they also have a progressive timeline leading up to 2030. Um, um, a lot of these systems would, um, you know, th these are um, just a caveat that uh, they would also need a lot of enabling um, factors. Uh, number one is uh, technology. Um, um, a lot of the systems, for example, this one and the one in UK, I think um, they are using um, parang, uh, camera monitoring um, um, devices for, for tracking, you know, for, for looking in, into um, um, the, the vehicles that are are, are moving or entering the zones. Um, another one is really focusing on the social aspects, yung social acceptability um, of uh, these types of, um, uh, let's say, uh, regulations. And also one thing to consider also is the, 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 the impacts in terms of the overall uh, system, transport system, because if, if um, vehicles are not being allowed in a certain area, kailangan merong alternatives kasi. It's not just about restricting vehicles in one zone without taking into consideration the whole network. Um, it might actually lead to more um, you know, people diverting to other places na magkakaroon pa ng um, more congestion if the, the, the system is not properly planned for. Um, so yeah, I'm just giving the... Um, the details here, but you can check it out later. Uh, a very similar situation in uh, South Korea. Um, <clears throat> so they, they've <clears throat> adopted a wider vision in terms of uh, reducing greenhouse gases in, the, in terms of uh, um, having a wider, um, longer term transport vision. And this is where they, uh, or, or this is what they use as a basis for putting up the, what they call the green transportation zone. Um, so they target um, all light duty vehicles that are pre-2002. Um, the mechanics is that it works uh, from 6 to 9 uh, a.m., uh, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m., and they monitor through different access points throughout the city. Uh, same principle, you have to pay a certain fine if you, um, you know, cross the, the zone um, based on the time here. Um, but they also provided financial support for those um, you know, um, kung yung gustong mag-upgrade ng vehicles, for example, um, 
just uh, again as, as an example for. Um, yeah, I won't. I, I'll skip some of the slides because I think I just have fifteen or sixteen minutes left. Um, but anyway, so um, we've seen um, the vehicles, the usage, uh, access regulations, um, and again, like a combination of different operational measures. This is the experience uh, or, or what they're trying to do in in Shenzhen, China, just to give you an idea of the preferential, let's say, um, measures that are gearing towards uh, um, um, electric vehicles. This is more on the logistics side of things, but. Um, in terms of um, you know um, providing access in terms of daytime entry exemption from odd even schemes um, registration um, in in the city as well as uh, in the in the different zones so as compared to the other types of vehicles um, let's go now to some examples for for parking um, in terms of uh, parking po so well I think in in Pasig wala pa naman ties gurong mga dedicated uh, parking lots and with um, um, EV enabled uh, or EV enabled parking lots, no, uh, or charging enabled parking lots. But maybe in the future it might be useful to think about um, how these are going to be used. Whether um, these can be used um, only by electric vehicles while they are recharging the vehicle, um, or if they can be used by electric vehicles regardless of whether they are charging or not. So, kung Pwede ba sila mag-park doon kahit tapos na sila mag-charge? Or parking for non-EVs on the um, EV-enabled parking lot is allowed in certain situations. So kung wala gumagamit or during certain times of the day, during um, kung libre siya, or baka pwedeng may maximum number of minutes or hours that the non-EVs can park there. Or it could be in terms of uh, differential parking rates that are going to be um, allowed, no? So pwedeng free parking plus magbabayad ng electricity, electricity fee yung uh, magpapark at mag-charge doon. Or it could be in terms of regular parking rates or progressive parking rates. So for example, um, aside from the um, electricity and the cost of electricity that's being consumed, the parking rates uh, can increase during the duration of the parking uh, session. Or it could be a combination. So again, this is um, you know thinking about the future once we have these uh, types of uh, of uh, parking uh, facilities. So in terms of Amsterdam, they've um, used a combination of this and they are moving towards uh, progressive parking. Um, one of the key features that they did um, to, to stimulate the adoption of EVs was in the, in the, in the start known as to provide free parking. Um, just a, a note on this, um, it cannot be like, cannot be forever. Uh, we cannot uh, incentivize uh, parking uh, per se. Um, as it is, uh, and give it free. So this is, uh, um, you know, uh, urban concern in, in general. So aside from parking, we we there are certain uh, provisions for providing uh, incentives for e vehicle users um, in terms of using specific uh, uh, lanes, for example. But these have to be integrated into broader goals and um, have, must be backed up by national policies. Um, and I think this is also important to consider. Um, this is something that uh, we would be tackling tomorrow um, in more technical detail because we have the experts there. Um, but in terms of, uh, for example, in in uh, in the U.S., there have been some um, you know um, poly uh, approaches that are being um, done at the local level. Um, that in terms of ensuring the preparedness for the integration of hardware through the building code like regulation in terms of pre-facilitating, for example, um, mandating the installation of empty tubes for future cables, passive infrastructure pre-wiring, and you know, um, uh, facilitating active infrastructure. Talagang maglagay na or mag-require na for each um, facility or housing, etc. Merong specific lots or space that would be dedicated for um, such parking um, charging facilities. So yeah, and for example, this one mandated new homes to be pre-wired, moving towards charging and parking requirements uh, for hotels, apartments, commercial buildings. And um, for example, um, Seattle has adopted a version of the electrical code um, that added added notable changes that included certain language that is uh, facilitative of uh, EV charging facilities. So you know, in terms of language, um, they are, uh, these are just a couple of examples 
um, in terms of how they are doing it, um, just to facilitate the the, the shift towards, uh, uh, let's say, EV inclusive uh, types of uh, buildings. And I'll go through the financial instruments uh, quite quickly. Again, Maramita in different types of uh, financial incentives, financial uh, mechanisms. Um, the one that I would highlight here, um, yeah, so we do know about uh, a lot of these uh, purchase subsidies, which might not be too relevant uh, in the case of local governments in uh, Pasig, lalo na yung sa, you know, pagbili ng mga EVs, pagbili ng private EVs, for example. But um, there are a lot of these uh, types of different mechanisms that are being uh, implemented globally, as well as, uh, for example, these ones are from the EU. I uh, just wanted to highlight this one. No? So, um, rin po pung ngayon uh, na nangyari in terms of um, local governments subsidizing, uh, for example, e cargo bikes. Um, siguro, this is something that might be possible to do um, in, in some sort of fashion in the, in the cities in the Philippines. Number one, because the costs are um, hindi naman siya katulad ng uh, pagbili ng uh, electric car, for example. Um, so, there are different mechanisms that are being um, uh, tested. So in terms of uh, providing direct financing, in terms of uh, looking into um, providing certain portions of uh, or certain amounts for, for, for purchasing of e-bikes e and e-cargo bikes and for leasing leasing schemes po, no? So, um, so if, for example, this one is a good example, leasing schemes for young families for trying out cargo cycles before buying. So um, just to provide that uh, certain picture that uh, a lot of these things are also possible. I, I won't go through the details. You can uh, check uh, these slides later on, but there are different uh, incentives in terms of um, giving competitive advantage to EV owners in terms of registration fees in terms of uh, the fees that are associated with the ownership of the vehicles per se, in terms of the, the different uh, um, um, reduction in, in, in income, corporate taxes, if you are using um, electric vehicles, um, and also if you are putting up charging facilities. Um, maybe again, for, for the charging facilities, tomorrow we would discuss this more in detail. Um, there are other types of uh, financing uh, um, incentives that are happening uh, more, for example, on the research uh, part of uh, uh, or the, on the research side, maybe again, something that you might think of uh, asking or, or um, <laughs> uh, um, providing ideas to the national governments in terms of, um, you know, facilitating some research, uh, city level, urban level research uh, initiatives um, on the ground to, to be able to um, to support e-mobility. Communication instruments very quickly. Um, again, it's really about sensitizing the, the public um, in terms of um, the, the advantages of e-mobility and uh, siguro debunking some of the, um, let's say, myths. No? Uh, very important um, in terms of uh, having that wider support. Uh, there are a lot of different mechanisms, um, you know, different schemes, um, more on the national level, fuel economy, CO2 la uh, labeling schemes. There are different um, types of social campaigns and the use of um, information, especially for, I think for the Philippines, very important to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the, the, the role of social media is playing um, um, in, in, yeah, in, in our lives. No? So uh, provi providing information, providing messages uh, that would be supportive of e-mobility and uh, also doing a lot of uh, different uh, types of on-the-ground activities. Maybe not now during the pandemic, but later on, um, um, let's uh, um, keep the ball rolling in terms of these types of activities. Signages are uh, later um, probably something that uh, can be discussed um, um, in the uh, um, city level discussion. So now these are going to be um, tackled, uh, but it has to be clear, it has to have, um, you know, com communicable and commands uh, certain respect from, from the users. Organizational level, po, um, different types of um, mechanisms that probably the, the local governments can um, uh, look into, uh, especially in the, in the uh, immediate term. So the first one is uh, electrifying your own fleets. So the first, um, you know, if, if you would be 
adopting more and more or, or you know testing out these types of vehicles i think this is what we're also trying to do in the demonstration uh, project with basic they are going to be using uh, some of the uh, shared vehicles shared electric vehicles for their own operations for the uh, the transport of, uh, of medical equipment and uh, transportation of employees so para po makita ng uh, ating mga constituents yung benefits at kung paano to gumagana it's very important so one of the i think the first things that the local governments in the philippines can do try it out and uh, maybe look forward towards uh, procuring or, or utilizing more of these types of vehicles in the future um, in terms of um, procurement, no? so aside from um, electrifying the own fleets, it, uh, the uh, local governments can also look into um, pushing suppliers, contractors to actively look into using more EVs. Um, um, also, maybe in terms of imposing certain requirements um, that are related to the provision of such services. Again, these are uh, possibilities. <laughs> um, um, that uh, we can look into towards into the future. Just wanted to share this uh, interesting slide from this project by set. So what they did was to coordinate with the uh, different cities um, in Europe. I think they were working initially with five cities um, and they wanted to uh, influence or put up um, procurement guidelines for the purchases of innovation. So particularly in terms of electrified automated uh, transportation services. What they did was to, to, to map out the footprint of lahat ng procurement na ginagawa nila, prioritize nila yung sectors, and then they talked to the market and they prepared um, innovative procurement plans. Um, in terms of the types of uh, innovations that they incorporated into the procurement processes, so they um, you know, looked into the award criteria, looking at minimum specifications that are geared towards cleaner services, preference for non-motorized transportation. Um, um, so for example, in terms of uh, um, providing uh, um, utility services ng paglinis, ganyan. So there are certain mechanics ng paggamit ng cargo bikes, etc. Or they, they, also, they can also require sustainable fleet certification, um, requiring transportation data monitoring in, for the contractors, increasing of contract length. So lahat ng mga magpapasok ng mas um, sustainable services, um, they would be geared towards uh, doing so kasi mas matagal yung kontrata. Um, and uh, some other things, so like providing for on-site uh, infrastructure, etc., and providing guidance to the companies. <clears throat> I'll, I'll skip some of the slides because I have four minutes, but um, the other organization tools, I think this is also um, being looked at in PASIG in terms of uh, looking into your own facilities. I think the parking lot, um, the big parking lot in PASIG, they're trying to um, integrate the uh, EV charging facilities and also dun sa, sa shared vehicle scheme, tinitingnan yung potential pag-integrate ng mga charging facilities dun sa government-controlled uh, uh, health facilities. So a lot to, to think about moving towards into the future, integrating e-mobility, um, starting off with your own uh, facilities. Facilitating permitting for charging facilities. Again, maybe in, in looking forward into the future, there, these are some of the... Uh, the examples, no? um, pag, for example, sa, uh, these are from the U.S. again. Um, so if you are putting up a certain um, 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 EV charging equipment uh, facility, you need to go through the permitting process. And um, these are certain um, me um, measures na para mapagaan yung proseso for, for applying for such uh, uh, permits. Uh, and certain incentives like waiving of inspection fees, same day permitting, um, yeah, and then providing uh, as well mga opportunities for engaging and for for learning for for the different uh, uh, potential uh, uptakers ng ganitong classing facilities, especially if you're integrating such into existing facilities or you're putting up a new one. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip this slide, but just for siguro for, for um, taking into account na marami din pong mga emerging business models that are happening and maybe in the future, a lot of these things uh, need to be considered also at the local level in terms of processes, ayan, mga ganyan, permitting, uh, in terms of providing maybe incentives as well for these types of um, 
of uh, business models within the value chain. Um, again, very important po na uh, integrated into the wider plans, I think, uh, um, in, the, in the process of uh, doing the, let's say, um, the, the urban mobility plans or yung sa atin, yung local transport uh, route planning. No? Siguro kailangan, I think, uh, may mga elements done in terms of uh, looking into green routes, etc. But it has to be um, siguro wider integration in the wider land use uh, plans and urban mobility plans sa ginagawa natin. It's very important. And may, may, maybe just to, to food for thought in terms of uh, prioritizing complementing pri uh, public transportation and maybe looking into um, making a dent in terms of private vehicle mentality and um, utilizing e-mobility, um, prioritizing them in terms of feeding into the, the, the public transport systems and to improve, uh, improve the uh, first and last mile um, um, legs of the trips and through maybe shared EV systems. Uh, pinag-isipan po na konti yung sa case ng Philippines case ng Pasig. Uh, these are just some potential ideas um, in terms of uh, you know what uh, might be some um, um, uh, regulations, for example, um, key priorities in terms of uh, operations regulations. So maybe in the context of local governments, meron naman tayong uh, certain mandates in terms of um, ensuring safety sa local roads, for example, kung paano gamitin, pwedeng gamitin yung mga EVs there. Um, future iteration, at least for PASIG, um, I think pinag-uusapan na rin nila na um, include yung electric tricycles um, in the next iteration of the tricycle upgrading ordinance. Maybe something that can be considered. Um, local building codes guidance on EV-ready infrastructure. Again, moving towards into the future, how would this be um, integrated in in um, in the whole planning process. Sorry, my timer. Okay, uh, I'll just wrap up. Huh? Financials incentives to developers. So maybe um, in looking into the revenue code, there were certain incentives there. For example, for um, um, sustainable mobility, but uh, maybe um, whether in siguro consider somehow in the future. Um, papani yung mga mga development that would um, uh, support e-mobility. So maybe that's something that can be discussed. Um, potentially consider specific percentage um, of the EST fund for e-mobility in the case of PASIC to um, be uh, ring-fenced or, or allocated for certain uh, um, e-mobility supportive infrastructure or activities. Organizational permitting incentives um, again across the different value chains. If you're providing or, or going through the business permitting, um, uh, building permits, etc. Exploring appropriate procurement approaches. Um, yeah, for the different services equipment that are being uh, um, um, procured by the city. Communications. It's uh, yeah inclusion of sensitization or to innovate is a key pillar in communication strategies and activities and potentially moving forward yung mga different events natin to you know, um, highlight the uh, immobility in our multimedia presence. So just to wrap up, uh, yeah, I have two minutes. Um, so we've seen uh, that there are various local level policy measures um, that we can use or we can explore in terms of uh, supporting, accelerating immobility that have been made available uh, through global experiences. Although um, just a caveat again, it's... Uh, about uh, taking these concepts and um, putting them into the local situations. Malaking, um, malaking uh, bagay po kasi yung, yung contextualization um, to be able to make these uh, concepts work. Um, we may not need to start from scratch um, based on prior experience. Um, there's also a lot of... Uh, benefits in terms of learnings from other cities is also what we're trying to do in Solutions Plus. Um, -usap yung mga different cities in terms of the common challenges, common um, and potential ways forward na din, um, in, in the other cities that are more relatable So mga from, from the developing countries. Um, so yeah, not a straightforward contextualization is quite important, leading towards um, integrating these into wider social technical systems. Um, we would want to look into combination of different uh, policy measures. So not 
one bullet would be enough, I suppose. Um, and uh, just considering the, the limitations, the challenges, um, you can combine some of the measures to, to be able to maximize the, the benefits as well as ensure the integration of e-mobility into wider uh, frameworks and goals. So with that, I, uh, I think, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your patience. I hope I did not bore everyone with the presentation. Thank you, Alvin. You did not at all. <laughs> so there are a lot of in instruments now that we saw that we can consider indeed. Um, I think it will be a good exercise actually when you presented the last few summary, Alvin, now that after this session, one follow-up that I can already think of is revisiting this list and the image that you have presented and, and see what are the different instruments uh, that can be taken up by PASIC team and also the, the steering committee. So, you know, based on the targets that will be set on, let's say, EVs uh, by PASIC, because PASIC is also going to be developing the, the e mobility roadmap, by the way, uh, what are the different strategies that the city can take? Uh, what are the opportunities that can be had at city level? Uh, later on, we'll touch a bit more about the, the regulatory and the alignment of the national and local government. Uh, I believe we'll have the, uh, Siddharth from, from ET. His presentation is going to be about that. Uh, one example is like integration of the hardware to uh, building code legislation. They also have some examples of this from India. Uh, financial instrument, the second one, uh, what are the different uh, governance and, and uh, instruments that can be done at city level. Maybe there are incentives and disincentives that can be provided. So uh, on the communication front, um, a lot of public events uh, already done by the city. So we have seen some of that. If you are following, uh, if some of you are following the Passive Transport a Facebook page, you would see that they're also um, enhancing the communication strategy. No? So we'll also touch on this on Friday uh, because we'll have a chance to determine and see how they can be targeted to, let's say, now e-trikes, uh, the enterprises, uh, and, and, and shared mobility device users. No? So uh, and really impressed that even within passive transport, I believe they have a communication person uh, focused on that. So thank you so much for that overview, Alvin. Um, but now let's go to uh, ASEAN first. Uh, now that we have seen how these are done uh, outside of Asia or outside of Southeast Asia, uh, we had a chance to cooperate with UNEP on aligning uh, regional efforts. Uh, and we'll hear more from Bert about this, uh, about the ASEAN uh, standards and guidelines. So um, Bert, uh, he leads the work of, of UNEP, uh, UN Environment Program, uh, uh, Air Quality and, and Mobility Unit in Asia Pacific. So he's been coordinating uh, UNEP's efforts on clean fuels and vehicles in Asia Pacific. Uh, that also includes the Global Fuel Economy Initiative and also the integration of uh, electric two and three wheeler transport modes uh, into existing uh, traffic system. So Bert, I now give the floor to you. Maraming salamat, Kat, at uh, congratulations sa Pasig at uh, sa inyo sa Clean Air Asia. Nakita ko yung agenda, uh, very comprehensive at uh, mukhang talagang makakatulong sa Pasig at sa mga LGUs. May gari na dun sa survey, uh, nakita ko na maraming LGUs. Yung presentation ko, uh, ASEAN EV standards and guidelines no pero sa totoo lang uh, naka-focus ito sa uh, sorry sandali lang naka-focus ito sa uh, two and three wheelers uh, ito rin yung ginawa uh, based dun sa ginawa ng actually ni Professor Horizon Gitano ni Dr. Manny Biona at ibang members ng uh, EV Association sa Southeast Asia pero magsimula na lang ako sa huli Mas maigi siguro yun para baka ma... madaming slides. Hindi ko na maidi-discuss lahat pero gusto ko sana mag-focus dito sa summary and key issues. Um, una, uh, siguro yung gusto kong sabihin namin sa UNEP, uh, yung isang ginagawa namin, syempre reducing emissions, di ba? air pollution, CO2 emissions. Uh, meron kaming malaking program on electric uh, mobility, merong uh, global electric mobility program kasama yung Asian Development Bank, UNDP, uh, UNIDO at iba pang mga organization. Pero yung isang focus namin ay sa share the road. Yung share the road, uh, kailangan i-prioritize yung cycling, walking, public transport. So yun yung isang uh, tinitignan namin. Nakikita rin namin na yung e-bikes, 
Uh, pwede niyang uh, i-replace yung motorcycle and car trips. Eh. Lalo na dun sa mga malalapit lang. Marami sa mga trips natin sa Manila o kahit sa iba, ibang city sa atin, maiksi lang yung pinatravel talaga. Yung mga ibang key considerations, technical regulations, ito meron ng mga guidelines, may mga standards, may mga experts tayo sa Pinas. Pero usually itong lahat na to national. National government yung uh, merong responsibility dito. Yung susunod, yung operational regulations, meron ding guidelines galing sa national. Uh, kung anong speed, kung saan ba yung mag-operate, uh, paano yung mga tricycles, yung uh, route rationalization halimbawa, yung operations and management. Pero etong operational regulations, dito may power talaga yung cities. So maaari yung tignan ito. Uh, integration into traffic policies. Dito sa Bangkok, kung nasan ako nakabase, meron silang uh, tinatawag na motorcycle box. Kasi kung sa atin nagre-reklamo na kayo dahil ang dami ng motor, sabi nyo dahil traffic, uh, naka-aksidente, dito mas marami. At lalo na sa Vietnam. Parang 80% ng lahat ng uh, vehicle sa kalsada nila, motosiklo. Pero meron silang mga policies na pinapatupad. Yung isa nga dito, yung mga motorcycle two-wheeler intersection box. Ibig sabihin, kapag uh, dun sa lahat ng mga stop, intersection, merong uh, box, uh, painted box, na doon pinapapunta yung mga motorcycles o kaya ibang two-wheelers. Uh, na-realize nila ng mga traffic planners dito na kahit anong gawin mo, uh, makakalusot, eh, makakalusot itong mga two-wheelers sa traffic. Hindi naman masama yun. Kasya naman sila. So, ginagawa yun at uh, ginawa na lang nila ng yun nga yung motorcycle two-wheeler box. Yung susunod, yung integration to public transport. Importante ito, lalo na sa mga bikes at sa mga electric bicycles. Uh, may adequate uh, parking facilities. Yung kumbaga, parang hindi ba sila matatakot na mananakaw yung mga bisikleta nila. Yung isang issue din na kailangan tignan yung uh, conflict with pedestrians na sinasabi nila dahil itong mga electric two-wheelers daw or electric three-wheelers uh, mas mabilis tapos walang ingay. So minsan hindi napapansin ng mga pedestrian. So ano daw dapat yung gagawin dito? Yung susunod, um, supportive policies, ano, national versus city, nilagay ko lang din dito dahil naisip ko na maraming mga guidelines nga, maraming uh, regulations na national level. So umaasa tayo sa DOTR, sa LTO. Uh, pero may power din yung city. Dito siguro uh, sa amin sa UNEP at uh, kasama yung Cleaner Asia, Wuppertal Institute sa Solutions Plus, pwede namin tignan kung ano yung mga pwedeng gawin ng cities para ma-promote itong uh, integration of electric two and three wheelers. Insurance rationalization tax, manufacturing support, Sa ASEAN, itong manufacturing support, uh, napakalaki ng ibinibigay nila. Sa Thailand, meron silang uh, specific targets for production and uh, consumption. So, consumption, uh, consumption may, ibig sabihin, bibili nila. Production and consumption ng uh, two-wheelers, ng cars, tsaka ng buses for 2035-2040. Meron silang very specific uh, meron ding mga labeling schemes na na inadapt meron ako example mamaya sa Thailand papakita ko yung roadmaps charging infrastructure mga importante lahat to eh pero minsan kailangan na uh, may guidance ng national government o galing sa national government pero uh, narinig natin na uh, yung Pasig gumagawa sila ng sariling roadmap uh, tinitignan nila yung issue ng charging Baka maganda rin to dahil at least ma-pressure or makapag-add sila ng value dun sa ginagawang mga national level proposals. At dapat suportahan pa rin natin itong mga nangyayari sa mga cities. Itong slide, itong picture, kinuha ko lang yan sa uh, Twitter or sa uh, online. Eh. Pero ang gusto ko lang ipahiwatig, marami ngayong nagsasabi na okay, electric vehicles, lahat tayo, bili tayo ng electric cars, electric two-wheelers, lahat yan. Pero ang sinasabi namin, hindi lang technology yung makakapagsalba sa atin o hindi electric vehicles ang makakalutas ng problema natin sa transport, sa air pollution, at sa climate change. Kung titignan may picture, uh, umulan ng kaunti, syempre sobrang traffic. Alam naman natin lahat yun. Eh. Sa Pilkowa ata itong picture na ito nakuha. Syempre yung mga tao, masisisi mo ba sila? 
gusto nyo lang umuwi. So, kinukuha na nila yung malaking porsyento ng uh, uh, kalsada para makahanap ng sasakyan. Pag tinignan mo pa yung picture, isa o dalawang bus lang yun nandyan. Actually, isang bus nga lang eh. Uh, yung nasa likod truck. Uh, tapos, karamihan dyan, mga personal cars or, or uh, na, na isa, dalawa yung mga pasahero. So, ito yung kailangan natin na tingnan. At uh, sinabi niyo rin naman ni Alvin yun. At sigurado ako na yung ibang mga speakers sasabihin din yan. Eh. So, pero uh, sige, uh, magsimula tayo sa, sa slide. Ito ay tungkol lang naman sa, kumbaga, wala tayong yung electric bikes nandiyan na talaga. Ito, information, global data on exports. Kung makikita niyo yung graph, Uh, ng maigi, sorry, medyo maliit eh. Pero yung tumataas lang, exports ng bikes at saka two-wheelers. Tapos, uh, lalo na itong pandemya, gumaba lahat. Other vehicle components, buses, freight vehicles, light duty vehicles. Etong article na to, inopia ko lang sa New York Times, November 8, 2021. Uh, popularity of e-bikes isn't slowing down. Sigurado na to, uh, lalo na dahil sa pandemya, nagmumura, uh, napakadaling na uh, gamitin uh, at marami nang uh, bumibili. So, ito yung aasahan natin sa future. Sorry, itong slide na to parang uh, um, ibang galing lang sa representation ng ibang data pero kinumpara yung two-wheeler ICE, ibig sabihin yun yung internal combustion engine, yung pangkaraniwang motor kumpara dun sa electric two-wheeler. At tingnan natin, at tingnan nyo na mula ng 2017 pataas ng pataas. Kung titignan natin siguro yung 2021, sigurado ko na mas mataas pa yan. Uh, at uh, naiisip namin na ganito yung mangyayari sa future. So tayo sa Pilipinas, uh, sa Thailand, Southeast Asia o sa ibang parte ng mundo, kailangan natin talagang tingnan kung paano sila may integrate sa urban transport nang mas maayos. Kapag gumawa tayo ng mga policies and regulations lalo na sa cities, uh, ito gusto ko lang siyang laging ipakita dahil makikita natin na ang dami pa lang pinaggagamit ng two and three wheelers eh. Siguro hindi na natin mara masyadong kailangang isipin 'yon dahil tayo mismo sa Pasig alam na natin eh. Uh, tricycle, paglabas mo ng bahay, pupunta ka sa kanto, tricycle. Uh, o kaya meron kang motor, uh, bibili, uh, dyan lang sa, pwede mong sabihin sa kanto din, 300 meters away, magbumotor ka. Uh, ginagamit din to, lalo na itong pandemya sa mga deliveries, lahat naman ang delivery sa atin, uh, motor tsaka bisikleta. Dito sa Bangkok, actually mas marami motor, parang kaunti nga lang yung bisikleta, eh. so, mas uh, ano sila rito sa motor. Pero sa atin, ma maigay, nakita ko na may iba na nagbibisikleta din. Pero yung mga yun, parang easily, kung pwede mong gawing e-bikes yun, mas makakatulong din. So, syempre, meron ding three-wheeler freight. Uh, pwede rin siyang pang, uh, collect, yung collection ng waste, uh, uh, deliveries, and uh, of course, yung uh, public transport sa uh, tricycles natin. Itong slide naman na to, gusto ko lang i-revisit ba? So, galing din ako sa Clean Air Asia. Nung nasa cleaner siya ako, ito kasama si Alvin, yung ginawa namin, tinignan namin yung uh, travel behavior ng uh, madaming cities sa Asia. So, bali, uh, almost 6,600 people yung na-survey. Tapos, hindi ko alam kung ilang cities lahat eksakto, eh, pero mga 20 plus yan. Uh, nakita namin na 60% of all trips Uh, have travel time less than 30 minutes and have trip lengths of less than 6 kilometers. So siguro sa atin ngayon, lalo na dun sa nag-participate or yung nasa LGUs, pwede mong i-imagine eh. Okay, gano'n ba kalayo yung bahay ko? 2, 3, 4 kilometers. Siyempre yung iba mas malalayo. Pero ito yung karamihan. At yung isang sinasabi namin, uh, easily yung 6 kilometers, pwede siyang i-translate into cycling or or e-cycling or yung iba mo to siklo nga or public transport para transit. Kapag tinignan natin sa China no, uh, dito pwede mo sabihin nagsimula yung talagang paglaki ng number ng electric two and uh, electric two and three wheelers. More than 300 million 
ipipi mo, 300 million electric two-wheelers. Although karamihan dito uh, lead acid. Pero maaga sila nagsimula, year 2000 or 2000 plus, uh, hindi rin naman deliberate yung move na yun dahil, uh, or hindi national effort, nangyari siya dahil maraming cities noon na nagbaban ng motorcycles. Dahil sa accidents, uh, mabilis. Tapos nung time na yon early 2000, eto rin yung time na yung China gumagawa ng maraming kalsada sa mga cities nila. Eh. Dahil yung mayaman na daw sila, nagkakaroon sila ng maraming kotse, gagawa na sila ng mas maraming kalsada. So halimbawa yung Beijing, uh, originally meron lang siyang three ring roads yung tawag. Ring roads, pa circular dun sa Beijing. Pero ngayon parang ten, uh, ten ring roads na yon So gumawa sila ng gumawa ng mga kalsada para dun sa mga kotse. At the same time, binaban yung mga motorsiklo. So dumami yung gumagamit ng electric. Uh, siguro on hindsight, naging uh, okay rin yun dahil siyempre naging sila yung number one manufacturer ngayon sa mundo on electric two-wheelers at uh, ini-export na din nila to. Pag tinignan mo yung uh, eto meron ako nakuha ng mga Uh, standards nila in terms of comparison ng 1999 to 2019. So dati nililimit nila yung speed, speed from 20 kilometers per hour. Ngayon 25 kilometers per hour. Yung vehicle weight, mas mataas na rin. Yung engine power, mas mataas na rin. Pero 400 watts lang yan. Ngayon karamihan sa market, pag bibili kayo ng electric two-wheelers, makakita kayo 250 watts or 500 watts. Or tapos yung iba yung 1,000 watts pataas na. So mga electric bicycles yan. Pero syempre sa electric motorcycles, lahat mas mataas na. So pati battery voltage, tinaasan din nila for the 2019 standard. Yung lahat ng uh, electric uh, bicycles nila, pwedeng, gumamit, pwedeng dumaan sa mga bike lanes. In terms of popularity naman, uh, itong chart ng electric bicycle ownership, kung makita natin, countryside and city, 2018, 75% of all households or per 100 households uh, merong electric uh, bicycle. Pati sa 2018, uh, 58%. 58% uh, so, ganyan yung nangyayaring sitwasyon ngayon sa, sa China. So, kung iisipin mo yan, medyo... Okay din sila dahil nagtataas na naman yung uh, presyo ng langis eh. At siguradong tataas pa rin to. Uh, Siyempre kailangan bumawi ng mga manufacturers ng uh, yung mga oil companies. So ngayon nagpipick up yung demand, tataas ng tataas pa yung presyo. Pero at least kung uh, nakahanda yung transport system mo, hindi ka masyado maapektuhan o pwede kang mag-adapt. Sa India, magaling yung magpe-present si Siddharth Singh ha, mamaya. Uh, marami silang policy na late yung India sa sa electric mobility pero over the last five years ang dami nilang ginawang policies yung same uh, i-explain niya sa inyo uh, konti pa lang yung electric two-wheelers nila sa India at mostly electric motorcycles to eh. mahilig sila sa motor uh, pero meron din silang 2.5 million electric three-wheelers na again hindi talaga siya deliberate national or city effort parang organically uh, uh, lumaki uh, yung number of electric uh, three-wheelers nila. Karamihan din lead acid. Pero ito yung mga informal transport nila sa cities. Eh. Tawag nila rickshaws. Siguro yung magandang i-point out ko lang dito, pag tinignan nyo yung sa electric two-wheelers column, no registration and license for electric two-wheelers with speed less than 25 kilometers per hour. So, tandaan nyo to uh, dahil pag diniscuss nyo yung guidelines sa LTO, malalaman nyo yung uh, at least the diferensya. Yung sa electric three-wheelers din, no permits required for electric rickshaw with a top speed of 25 kilometers per hour. At meron pang uh, 30,000 rupees subsidy for retrofitting. Siguro, siguro mga 24,000 pesos yun, subsidy for uh, retrofitting. So, pero kung makikita nyo, meron ng programa yung gobyerno nila na suportahan itong sector ng uh, informal uh, three-wheeler three or public transport three-wheeler sector. Dapat ganyan din tayo sa Pilipinas. 
punta tayo dun sa policy guidelines for electric two and three wheelers for Southeast Asia. Ito yung sinasabi ni sinabi ni Alvin at uh, dinevelop namin kasama nga si Professor Gitano, si Dr. Diona at ibang EV associations kasama yung Singapore, uh, Thailand, uh, Malaysia. Para may guidance lang. So I think anong year ba ito ginawa? 2020 lang na-release pero sinimulan namin 2019. Uh, yung objective sana para maibigay mo nga yung as reference sa mga countries. So nagawa naman namin uh, at yung iba, actually karamihan ng mga recommendations, halimbawa, kinuha din ng LTO. Pero hindi lahat. At saka may mga contentious elements doon. Uh, tingnan natin mamaya. Yung mga general policies pala, uh, nabanggit ko na yung iba, uh, hindi ko na uulitin Yung susunod na mga slides, more technical. Eh. Siguro sabihin ko lang kung ano yung uh, mga importante para sa atin. So simula pa lang yung uh, isang contentious uh, sa vehicle categories, itong speed, syempre. So yung pedestrian, nakita ko si Alvin may pinresent dun sa case ng Singapore, yung mga personal mobility devices. Uh, pero ito yung napag-agrihan namin kasama yung mga experts at industry. in sa speed limitation. So may tiyatawag na pedestrian speed less than 10 kph, slow speed 10 to 25, low speed 25 to 50, intermediate tsaka high speed. Yung intermediate and high speed essentially parang uh, pangkaraniwang motorsiklo na yan. Tapos may mga considerations din. Ito, important ito sa national government ulit eh, para malaman na okay yung mga nag-import ba, lalo na yung mga galing sa China, marami pa low quality. para makita na kung okay ba ito at uh, durable. So may mga ganitong guidelines na nire-recommend. Itong tropical rain test at flood warning test, actually si Professor Gitano talaga yung nag-recommend nito dahil syempre sa atin niya uh, bahain. So kailangan tignan kung paano magpe-perform itong mga electric uh, two-wheelers na to. Mas importante siya sa electric motorcycles, yung isipin mo kaysa sa electric bicycles. Una, dahil sa taas o depende kung nasaan yung battery at uh, mas madaling gawing uh, waterproof yung battery ng electric bicycle. So meron ding mga durability test. Ito yung vibration, drop test, knock over test. Uh, electrical safety standards, uh, importante yan. Bukas nakita ko meron kayong sessions on charging. So importante rin na madiscuss yan. Uh, May mga nagtatanong eh. So bumili ako ng electric two-wheeler, electric motorcycle, or electric three-wheeler. Okay lang ba na isaksa ko yan sa electric outlet dito sa bahay? So bukas, uh, sana yan yung uh, maisama sa mga discussion nyo. Pwede naman. May mga iba lang siguro na magkakaproblema. Pero uh, hindi lahat. Tapos pati yung mga labeling, again, safety concerns ito. Uh, kasama na dyan lahat yung mga recommendations. Uh, road usage. So ito yung isang uh, medyo contentious ngayon lalo na sa atin. Eh. So ang recommendation na, ginag na sa amin ng galing kasama yung industry at experts, so yung pedestrian, sidewalks, bike paths, which allow lower speeds. Yung iba, uh, magreklamo dito dahil lalo na yung mga uh, proponents ng electric stand kick, uh, ano matawag dyan? electric kick scooter na nakatayo, yung stand kick scooter. Uh, yung iba naman doon, uh, more than 10 kilometers per hour yung maximum speed. Pero less than 25 kph pa rin. So hindi lang dapat sila, uh, according sa kanila, sa sidewalks and bike paths, pwede rin sa low speed roads. Yung recommendation namin, yung slow and low speed, ito yung 10 to 50 kph, pwede dapat sa urban and residential roads. except na lang dun sa mga high speed uh, yung expressways uh, uh, na roads. Registration policy, operator age uh, requirement policy. Ito may power yung cities. Eh. So sana kung ano yung ia-adapt na policies ng cities, hindi siya balakid, hindi siya magbabawal. Kumbaga i-encourage niya uh, yung electric two-wheelers Depende kung ano dun sa sa guidelines ano na uh, hindi naman ibig sabihin kung meron kang electric bicycle na merong 1000 watt motor with maximum speed of 75 kph pwede ka na sa highway hindi naman ganoon so ito rin yung guidance 
pag pedestrian and slow yung category up to low speed so ito yung up to 50 kph pa nga sorry yung sa slow lang up to 25 uh, local authorities yung magde-decide or uh, pwedeng usually hindi na dapat ni register yun yung low speed um nire-require na lang plate uh, plate number ito medyo contentious din to nung pinag-uusapan namin kahit kami nung time na dine-develop ito para sa akin kung ako lang yung low speed yung up to 50 kph uh, electric bicycle hindi na kailangan ng plate number or hindi na dapat i plate number yun pero syempre katrabaho ko yung ibang experts at industry so kailangan mag-agree kami at ito yung napag-agreehan okay i require na lang din itong mga to uh, na i register pati yung age uh, requirements din uh, sa kabilang side Driver license uh, and yung recommendations. So pedestrian, slow, low speed. So again, ako, yung low speed, ito yung up to 50 kph na electric bicycle. Para sa akin, hindi na rin kailangan yun ng uh, driver's uh, license requirement. Uh, Siyempre yung uh, pagsusot ng helmet, actually dapat to sa lahat, pati kahit uh, sa pedestrian. Guidance on uh, maximum weight at maximum motor power. Uh, kung makita nyo may four-wheelers kasi meron na rin, marami na rin light electric vehicles. Ito yung mga electric vehicles na less than 1,000 kilograms, uh, maximum speed of uh, 50 kph, uh, na maliliit. Marami ng ganito nga yung klaseng vehicles. Eh. Uh, Kahit sa China, marami ito at nag export na rin sila. Marami na rin siguro sa atin. So, ito yung mga requirements. Yung susunod na set of slides, hindi ko na i-discuss. Mga examples lang ito ng mga ginagawa namin. Ito yung sa Pasig. Sa Vietnam, uh, ganun din. Meron silang uh, ginagawa ngayon actually na battery swapping guidelines. Eh. Pati sa Thailand. Yung Thailand, talagang proactive sila. Uh, progressive. Uh, last year, nag-adapt na sila ng uh, labeling scheme for electric two-wheelers. Similar din to dun sa, sa, L, sa LTO categorization. Merong electric bicycle, may two -wheel, electric two-wheelers, meron din uh, uh, yung electric motorcycle. Na. Pero meron na silang rating scale. Sa atin, meron tayong ginagawang rating. Uh, Tutulungan namin yung Department of Energy, pero... Matumal at uh, na-delay ng lalo dahil sa pandemic. Pero dahil hindi rin ganun yung suporta ng industry, lalo ng mga car manufacturers. Pero anyway, etong nasa left, left side, sorry, in, in a tie. Pero ito yung targets nila. Uh, yung targets for uh, two and three wheelers, cars, tsaka buses. Tapos yung Thailand, nag-adapt din sila labeling scheme, yung eco sticker. Ito na ngayon yung itsura nila. For hybrid, Makikita mo, halimbawa, itong nasa right side na uh, na photo. 1.9 liters per 100 kilometer, 43 grams uh, CO2. Uh, ito yung sa hybrid. Kapag pumunta ka dun sa left, sorry, hindi malak masyadong malaki ang uh, makikita niya. Pero CO2 zero, tailpipe, ha, of course. Tapos meron siyang 154.2 kilowatt hour uh, consumption. So, na-integrate na ng Thailand yung uh, electric vehicle sa labeling scheme nila. Ganon sila ka-advance. Uh, ito rin yung sinusubukan namin kasama rin si Dr. Biona at ang iba pa, uh, EVAP, sy syempre, na magkaroon din sa at sana sa atin ng ganitong uh, initiative kaagad. Siguro yun lang. At uh, kung meron pang uh, ibang mga questions or comments, nandito pa ako. Pero kailangan ko rin umalis after 10 minutes dahil Meron akong ibang uh, meeting. So, yun lang. Maraming salamat at uh, congratulations ulit sa lahat. Maraming salamat, Bert. Uh, yo, oh, oh, actually, maganda yung uh, nasabi mo kanina na yung i-contextualize nga. No? So, naturally, maraming bisikleta sa Pilipinas, maraming sa mga cities din natin na uh, nag-shift towards uh, electric kick scooters especially given yung parang yung reduced public transport na capacity no in the last uh, few months and actually in the last year so uh, siguro mamaya ting din tingnan din natin yung LTO uh, papasadahan natin yon i will go through yung different uh, 
categories niya will focus dun sa smaller modes of transport. So, very appropriate yan. Uh, ang pinukus natin dun ay yung two and three meters. Uh, and then, let's see if we can siguro have a more dis, uh, uh, focused discussion dun sa what are the anticipated uh, challenges ng cities dun sa administrative orders sa regulations natin. Uh, nakita natin sa news, if you have been following news on the e-bikes, uh, there have been some uh, LGUs that that are needing clarifications kung how, how do we implement that, etc. So, uh, maganda that we're also joined now by not just Pasig City, I believe yung sa participants natin, meron din from other LGUs. Um, baka meron din kayong insights or questions. Uh, we can, of course, compile that and elevate that uh, into a, para magkaroon din ng dialogue with LPO at some point. So, uh, pero I believe uh, Pasig has also proactively cooperated with, with with civil society organizations now to understand the operational challenges na AO. Uh, so, siguro, uh, just to also reiterate if may mga questions kayo, if you have questions and clarifications, um, you can put them in the chat box. Uh, if, if Bert is not able to address your comments when he's away, we can follow up uh, that and we can uh, reach out to you bilaterally, bilaterally then. So uh, thank you, Bert. So, uh, so Dr. Horizon, he's the founder and uh, chief technology officer now, Focus Applied Technologies in Malaysia. So we have been collaborating with him in UNEP, also on the regional alignment and with other ETS associations in, in, the, in, in ASEAN, in Southeast Asia. Uh, and he's worked uh, with a UN uh, framework on climate change on various vehicular emission projects uh, between two, 2011 to 2017. So uh, we'll hear a, a bit more about the process of how guidelines and standards came about in Malaysia. Uh, and I believe that would be an interesting uh, insight then for us as we navigate uh, uh, the new regulations that are being set up in the Philippines and different cities uh, in the Philippines. So with that, uh, Dr. Horizon, you may now have the floor. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm glad to be here once again. Uh, I think an awful lot of uh, what I'm going to cover has really only been talked because many of our local um, regulations have been into the ASEAN regulation. Uh, but I will go over sort of our regulations together. Uh, so let's throw uh, time for question and answer. Session. And so I'm going to blow through some of these slides fairly quickly. Uh, so if, uh, if I miss skipping over anything that you want more detail on, please stop me. Uh, feel free to ask a question. Um, so uh, yeah, I run a technology company. We're a spinoff from one of the universities. We're uh, heavily involved in uh, transportation, transportation studies and oh. instrumentation and whatnot. Um, and since working at the university, we've also been involved in the development of uh, standards, electric vehicle standards. Um, and uh, this goes back quite a long time. So uh, more than more than 10 years, uh, we've been developing standards. And as you'll see, we categorize them based on vehicle speed, because generally uh, we see as a lot of the um, a lot of the aspects of the vehicle uh, are based on the vehicle speed, like what roads you're allowed to use and do you need uh, safety equipment or not. Uh, hello. Um, of course, uh, as was mentioned, it was simply sort of a history of the development of the standards of later classes of standards. Uh, a lot of these have been fed into, so as was mentioned uh, uh, by uh, Bert, just concept use of in the development of the standard, you really do need to confirm uh, to give us a lot of the data, qualify as a given type of vehicle, and are they passing standards or not. However, we we go and test them. So if they claim, make a claim as to range or number of discharge cells, uh, you know, we, we, we trust them on, but we also go and verify. Um, and that's, that's really important because, you know, why do we even bother making standards? And predominantly, it's for safety. You know, we need to make sure, uh, as was mentioned previously, that uh, we don't have dangerous products out on the road. We want to make sure that when someone buys uh, a product, that it's, you know, a reasonably safe product. There are some minimum levels of quality, and we're not trying to push super high quality standards via the uh, 
the standard. We're trying to basically say we want to eliminate the very low quality products where the customers are products from uh, inexpensive to luxury products. And I will uh, dispense with a lot of the introductory stuff because we've gone over that briefly, but we've got quite uh, a history of developing standards here for electric vehicles in Malaysia. Um, we use them fairly extensively, but mostly there are two wheelers, uh, not a lot of three wheelers. Um, uh, also, as was mentioned, some of the Malaysian standards have been adopted and adapted into some of the ASEAN standards. Uh, and a lot of our sort of, I like to call it light duty electric vehicle standards have been applied to four wheelers as well. These are the mini car or, or you know, small car type uh, vehicles that we're talking about. So there's a lot of different uh, pressures when you're trying to develop standards and legislation relating to these vehicles. And as everyone's mentioned, there's a lot of promise for these vehicles. They're very efficient. Um, they can enhance the uh, mobility of a lot of people, especially in the B40, because they're so uh, affordable. Um, but we need to make sure that they are uh, safe for the road. Um, we want to ensure a reasonable minimum level of quality and compatibility with existing infrastructure. So. Uh, how do we go about developing the standards? Well, the way we do it in Malaysia is we have a standards committee. It's fairly broad based committee. We have uh, representatives from various government departments, including the highway and the police, transportation, uh, standards. We have a, a, um, a ministry of standards, basically, uh, road safety. We also include people like uh, environment. We have industrial partners, and these are partners, um, sometimes they're uh, vehicle associations, like for example, there's the Electric Vehicle Manufacturers Association in Malaysia and also within ASEAN. So we always have their representatives. We have uh, representatives from the automobile and motorcycle manufacturers. Uh, we also include a few academics, but not too many because those guys like to talk a lot. Um, so when we, when we develop standards, there's a few uh, basic rules that we try to follow. Um, safety of the consumer and the other road users is always the first priority. Protection of the consumers from poor quality is a secondary priority. Um, also, we, we try to, to do or, uh, or, or legislate or mandate only what's necessary, but we also try to make sure that we mandate all of what's necessary. We don't want to leave out something that's very, very important. Um, also, uh, in number five down there, you can see if you can't measure it, don't spec it. A lot of countries um, adopt uh, specifications or standards from overseas, which is which is pretty reasonable. But uh, why are you specifying a given standard if you don't have the ability to measure it? It's you're basically wasting time. So. Um, in general, we do try to follow European practices or, or other existing appropriate international practices, uh, but we adapt, add, or change those as required for the local situation. So we, uh, we update these on a regular basis. Um, the, the reasons we update them is to try to keep pace with technology, but also to simplify them or add clarification in case something isn't clear uh, in a previous revision. Um, now, for other countries, when other countries are, are developing standards, and, and even within Malaysia, you really do need to consider some of the constraints uh, on the, the government or the body creating these. Manpower, you know, do you have the manpower to perform, you know, the, the testing that you're going to uh, try to implement? You've got to have sufficient manpower and also other resources, financial resources and uh, sort of like the technical capabilities. Uh, budget, right? You've, you've got to have a budget. Uh, you know, if we've got a standard on emissions and we're going to test it, well, someone has to come up with the budget for the test centers and the equipment and the calibration and training, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, knowledge. Um, one of the things we see uh, not so much in transportation, but in some of the other uh, standards within Malaysia is the federal government has very reasonable standards, but the local government units that will do the enforcement, oftentimes they don't have the expertise, they don't have the tools required 
to do the enforcement. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, an important consideration. And of course, uh, space. Uh, when you start talking about testing uh, vehicles, for example, you you know you're talking about millions of vehicles potentially. You have to have the uh, space required to perform the testing. So, um, you know, uh, I guess reiterating a little is don't specify what you can't measure. Um, only specify things that are required in, in order to ensure the goals, uh, safety, quality, and compatibility. Generally, we, we like to remain technology blind. We don't want to say, you know, lead acid battery or lithium ion battery. What we want to say is the battery weight or size or performance has to be within these parameters. So we like to specify performance of the product rather than the technology because if you if you mandate a given technology if you've locked you've locked in uh, you know the technological development is not allowed to develop beyond a certain level um, now some of the other factors that are important uh, you know you know what are the factors that are important to consumers and one of the ways to discover that is to simply look at the advertisements you know you, here's an advertisement this one happens to be from the Philippines and uh, what do they talk about well they talk about obviously the cost uh, the power the speed the range things like that one of the things they frequently don't talk about when it comes to electric vehicles is the battery lifespan there's a good reason they don't talk about battery lifespan and usually it's because the battery lifespan is terrible um, uh, the, the low cost vehicles especially uh, one of the biggest customer complaints is the batteries don't last nearly as long as they are expected to so this is this is simply one way of getting at the quality factors that are important to customers is, is looking at the adverts So, um, also do a number of uh, we do we do a fair amount of field work. So a lot of our standards are based on very common sense, straightforward measurements. When we're talking about uh, measuring performance of these vehicles, one of the first thing we do is we go survey the vehicles. We survey the vehicle owner and, and find out what are their capabilities, what are the limitations, what are the issues. And so uh, what's presented here, uh, uh, brief results for survey performed with the mirror two years ago, I believe, um, looking at electric vehicle owners in Malaysia. So the way, the way we did it is we simply went around a number of different geographic locations. I'm afraid of photographs somehow uh, got squeezed but we did it in different parts of the country uh, a mixture of rural and urban areas and we surveyed the owners and we used the vehicle uh, registration insurance safety habits um, you know everything that's listed down there so we were interested in some of the vehicle specifications where do they get it how much did it cost what's the top speed what's the range etc cetera, etc cetera. We also wanted to focus on accidents because when you're developing legislation, you can arbitrarily generate legislation, but it's not the best way to do it. The best way is to do it in response to data and collect data and see are there, are there safety issues associated with these vehicles? And if there are safety issues, then we need to generate standards or legislation to deal with it. So uh, a result of some of these surveys, of course, um, what we saw is there was an awful lot of electric two wheelers. When we did some of these surveys in the Philippines, we found that the number of two and three wheelers were just about matched. Um, and it, uh, there were very few electric four wheelers that we found in, in this survey. We didn't, we didn't have a single electric four wheeler. Um, although a lot, of, a lot of governmental organizations, when you say, electric vehicles they tend to think of cars what we see in southeast asia is the electric vehicles in general are two and three wheelers um, it's a small segment of the market but it's growing very rapidly uh, we think today it's on the order of two percent of the two wheelers in malaysia are electric so it's it's a pretty significant number also we noticed that the largest class by far is the 25 to 50 kilometer per hour class and you can see in the lower left is a typical example and there's some kids obviously they don't have a license they're not wearing helmets but yet that vehicle that they're on can certainly go 35 40 kilometers per hour so we see that and we highlight okay this is this is a significant problem 
the photograph on the right shows a, a parking lot and it turns out two of the motorcycles there are electrics and only one is a combustion vehicle. We surveyed a bunch of brands and what we saw is uh, at the low end, of course, they're all 100% Chinese. There are several Malaysian manufacturers, but they generally do higher end products. They're the motorcycle class vehicles and 50 kilometer per hour and above. And they're not quite as popular because they're rather expensive. Um, trip purposes, predominantly the vehicles were being used to go for shopping and go back and forth to work with a minority being going back, back and forth to school. Usually it's, um, it's uh, mothers or parents sending the children back and forth to school. Uh, we had a, a study, we were looking at also the nationality of the writers. We found a fair number of foreign writers. One of the reasons there were so many foreign writers is they were typically foreign workers and they didn't have a license and they were under the impression that if they were riding an electric scooter, they didn't actually need a license, which is not uh, strictly correct, but that was the impression. Um, uh, also about half of the owners, a little bit less than half of the owners have no license. And so that's a, you know, it's, it's an important piece of information to understand how many people, you know, de facto, uh, how many people currently do have a license and none of these, uh, drivers were insured, but it, we're, we're generally talking about the 25 to 50 kilometer per hour class vehicles, which may or may not require insurance depending on the local authorities. Uh, gender, we looked into, um, there's a fairly even split between men and women. We looked at uh, income classes, and what we noticed is that the light duty electric vehicles are predominantly owned and operated by people kind of at the low end of the financial spectrum, not at the very bottom, but uh, certainly nowhere near the top. And we found a surprising number of these being used in the countryside. So if you had to compare the city versus the country, uh, they were very, very popular in the countryside for people going back and forth to their uh, orchards or rubber tree plantations. Whatnot. They're also used within the town, uh, but in terms of the density of vehicles, uh, we were really surprised how many were used in the countryside. Uh, there are some challenges for using these vehicles in urban settings, specifically charging. Uh, you know, in a, in a rural setting, when you park your vehicle at your house, you charge at your house. In an urban setting, if you're living in a high density building or a flat of some sort, very often there is no charging available down where your vehicles are parked. And oftentimes they're parked in the rain, which can make charging dangerous. So that's uh, certainly one of the issues. Um, in terms of demographics, we were also very surprised. The users of these vehicles we had aged from 12 years old to 70 years old, so a very wide range of ages. Um, uh, the average ownership had been something on the order of four years, and these vehicles were used quite heavily, like six days a week, but generally at very, very low mileages, on the average of about 33 kilometers per week. Typically, what we see a combustion two-wheeler in Malaysia is used on the order of 33 kilometers per day. So these vehicles are not a direct replacement for combustion vehicles. They're kind of a different class of vehicles. They're used for shorter trips. And uh, although they're used fairly frequently, they're used for uh, sort of short, low-speed trips. For a lot of these people, the electric vehicle was their main mode of transport. 95% of them said they basically only had this uh, electric scooter for transport. And um, most of them said that first reason they broken, they certainly go get another uh, because it's so convenient. The average cost of the vehicles were extremely low. Um, it ranged from 400 ringgits, which is about 100 USD, up to uh, 2,000 ringgits, which is about 500 USD. Um, the, 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 the inexpensive one was a secondhand vehicle. Uh, battery lifetimes on average, they last about two to four years. And the cost of replacing the batteries is on the order of about 100 USD. Some of the vehicle owners have changed their batteries as many as three times. And so this was a complaint for them. You know, when you buy a combustion vehicle, you know, uh, 10 years from now, it'll get the same range for the same number of, of liters of petrol. Uh, electric vehicles can't make that same uh, statement. 
maximum speeds were only on the vehicles that we surveyed only up to about 60 kilometers per uh, hour. And they, uh, a lot of them charge about four times per week. They have fairly low ranges. So we looked into the accidents, but we didn't have a statistically significant number of accidents to really make any huge conclusions. Uh, in general, their accidents where uh, most of them are single vehicle accidents. They simply drop the vehicle and there was a minority of them being bumped by a car. None of these were fatal. They were all fairly smart. There have been fatal accidents, but none involved in the survey that we, uh, we had measured. So the number one complaints from customers related to the battery life expectancy. The batteries just don't last as long as they'd expect and they're very expensive to replace. Uh, secondary complaints related to poor braking, expensive or non-standard tires, and then uh, wear and tear, just general wear and tear and overall quality on the vehicle. So these are, um, these are not necessarily going to force us to generate standards or legislation surrounding this sort of thing. On the other hand, when the battery life expectancy is the number one customer complaint in result, uh, we did go ahead and uh, generate standards uh, relating to this, saying that they need to maintain a certain minimum life expectancy on the battery. And if a manufacturer uh, wants to make a claim, then they have to meet or exceed that claim. And that, that, uh, the, the, this is some data from lead acid batteries. And it says that lead acid battery, if it's done in a, an appropriate sort of situation, it should last at least 300 charge discharge cycles, and that would give it a reasonable life expectancy. If it's being overcharged or over discharged, it won't last that long. So instead of mandating lithium batteries, which will typically last a very long time, we said, no, no, we're just going to have a minimum number of charge discharge cycles, uh, which is mandated. And we've done that basically across all vehicle classes. Now. Um, uh, this is just a graph showing the, the different vehicle types and this 25 to 50 kph uh, range vehicle uh, speed vehicle is certainly the most popular. Um, we've got some statistics on driver age and as I said there was a wide spread. Uh, and then we've got uh, just to, here's, a, here's a, a comparison of the vehicles. Essentially I think uh, given the time that's what I really wanted to cover is uh, how uh, how we how we put these standards together in Malaysia, and uh, maybe some of the conclusions we got out of there's just a just a few more conclusions here I'll go over. As was mentioned uh, by uh, India as well as uh, Bert and even Alvin, one of the important things will be to tie in these light duty electric vehicles to the given uh, transportation system, public transportation system. We don't want it to compete with it. That's been a problem in, uh, in China as well. We want it to really kind of work together with the local system. One way to do that would be to have local transportation hubs, which are interlinked. And at the local transportation hubs, if you provide charging, okay, people are, you know, they want to park their vehicles where they can charge them. So you have them park at a transportation hub and guess what? They can jump onto your public transportation system and zip to the uh, other end of the city or something like that. So uh, essentially the conclusions we've got from doing, you know, over a decade of this work here is that the electric two wheelers and, and small three wheelers are very, very efficient. Um, they're generally less expensive to own per year, but they're more expensive per kilometer when compared to conventional motorcycles. And that's because of the battery replacement. They're disproportionately preferred by the old, uh, the very young and the poor. And there's some socioeconomic reasons for this. They have a very successful niche um, and it tends to be the low power, low cost, low speed, relatively short distance uh, vehicles. They're not competing directly with internal combustion engine vehicles uh, because the cost of an electric vehicle, which can directly compete with a combustion vehicle, is simply too expensive most because the batteries need to be so big and so expensive. Uh, battery life was a uh, number one customer concern or complaint about their uh, vehicle. Um, a lot of the inexpensive Vehicle using very light components. Some were even based on bicycles. 
and a lot of the bicycle based vehicles would fail our minimum mechanical standard requirements. They, they basically weren't designed to hold the weight of the batteries and the vehicles were uh, overstressed. So we saw that during a lot of the testing. Uh, so we do need standards to address these, uh, these concerns. Uh, additionally, uh, unlicensed, uninsured riders are certainly a problem. Um, we expect them to have an accident similar to conventional motorcycles. What we've seen in our studies is that indeed the accident rate with motorcycles and electric uh, wheelers are, are commensurate. Uh, it's not to say that we're happy that we want to decrease the amount of apartment here called the JPJ and police uh, into this whole network of uh, collecting data so we can, we can come up with appropriate legislation and uh, uh, and then enforcing it once we do. Okay, for me, I think that's about it. What I'd prefer rather than to uh, uh, talk at you anymore is see if we've got any uh, questions and uh, address those questions. Hey, uh, thank you, Horizon. Uh, so that is actually often the sentiment of the general population that when they are coming out with, uh, I would say, new regulations, new policies in many cities, and it's not just in the Philippines, uh, there's always a, a call to understand or get the baseline information or at least the, the user profile uh, of potential and current users. Uh, as you said, could be as young as 12 years old, uh, up to 70 years old. And there, therefore, that kind of brings us back to the discussion on how do we make sure that we are ensuring their seamless travel, but ensuring that we have the right infrastructure for them uh, if, if they're you know, are there uh, lanes for that? Uh, could we dedicate a, a portion of the infrastructure for them and ensuring that, you know, if you're a 12 or a 70 year old, uh, it, that would somehow be um, uh, not a deterrent for you to, to try and use the electric two and three wheelers. And a general uh, idea like, uh, are the regulations uh, that are being developed in Malaysia generally acceptable uh, by the citizens? Yeah, um, we have not had any pushback from the public at all. Uh, of course, the government, when they develop a regulation before it becomes law, they have a fairly extensive period of public debate. So when we come up with uh, new standards, uh, we have um, sort of like uh, public uh, interactive public sessions where we invite in uh, lots and lots of people, uh, especially folks from industries. And we describe the uh, the new standards, the proposed standards, and we ask them to comment. So there's a mandatory period of public. And if there's any serious concerns raised by pretty much anybody, then we go and we have to address those before we can turn into law. What we see in general oh, of pushback, uh, people, they want to understand what it is mostly we get feedback sell a product um, how can we comply with driving the cost of the product up and of course the one of the biggest concerns a manufacturers have is say well if we're going to comply with it we want to make sure that everybody complies with it we don't want to see product which is non-compliant and cheap coming in because we can't compete with it you know we're by definition a higher level or a higher standard so that's the only thing that we've seen. Um, you know, there there may be issues where uh, if you've got people driving around not helmets and you in them, they may be unhappy with that. On the other hand, uh, I'm sure their family. Um, I'm not hearing the audio. Can you repeat that? Clearly, a question of your rising. Can I confirm that this is not from not a technical issue from my uh, end? Yes. Uh, negative feedback from the public for these things. Um, I, I lost you for a bit, Horizon. Uh, I believe uh, not only from my end. Thank you. 
okay here the the video is soft we may have had a bad um uh, okay. we may have had a bandwidth problem again mm -hmm. sorry could you repeat the last uh... okay so so the last little bit was you were, you're were asking about uh, the, the, the pushback we get during uh you know from the public or something like that and we yes don't. we uh we we find that we we get good acceptance from them you know some manufacturers concerned about some things but uh, in general, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's fairly acceptable to the public. Part of the reason is we also operate under um, sort of a usage of, of, of de facto usage. How is the product currently being used? And we look into that. We don't want to blindly mandate can or cannot do something. We look at how the vehicles are being used and is it a problem? And the fact is, if it's being used in a certain way, which maybe we would say shouldn't be done, if it's not causing a problem, then it's not a problem and we don't need to uh, you know, mandate that it can't be done. So what we try to do is, is what we call sort of data-driven legislation where we collect data and then when we've got the data and we say, absolutely, you know, if you do, if you do such and such, if you drive these overloaded, it's dangerous, we know it, here's the data. And then even if somebody did complain, it's like, well, we have the data, you know, if you have data to support your side or you have data that refutes what we're saying, then we'll listen to you. But if you don't, then you're just an opinion and we have data and uh, data trumps an opinion every time. Yeah, for sure. Um... I think we could also try and see how the Philippine one was, uh, how it's faring as compared to the ASEAN guidelines. We, we saw uh, a lot of good suggestions on how we could also um, enhance the ones that we have already on the ground and see the opportunities. Unfortunately, the, the Land Transportation Office uh, are, is not able to join us. We had a, a chat just right before we started this session. so. Uh, we can then elevate the outcomes and the discussions from this session uh, to uh, our other partners. Um, so uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Horizon. Hello, everybody. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. So my, my name is Siddharth Sinha. I represent uh, Niti Aayog of the Government of India. So Niti, Niti Aayog is the national institution for uh, transforming India. It's essentially India's uh, highest uh, policy-making agency, and we also serve as an official think tank of the government, and we were specifically tasked to catalyze, you know, economic development in the country, and you know, bring together different ministries uh, towards the common goal of economic development, urban development, and so on and so forth. So we work with a range of different ministries, and we are headed by uh, the Prime Minister of India. Um, uh, just before I jump into the whole electric vehicles thing, I just I just wanted to you know kind of bring to your attention why uh, you know this has become such an important issue in India because the transport sector contributes about fourteen percent of total emissions you know in India and this has more than tripled since you know nineteen ninety. If you see uh, you know if you see the graph on your right, what it shows you is that between two thousand five and two thousand fifteen the emissions have doubled. But if you look at this figure, you know from nineteen ninety onwards, this is actually sort of uh, you know, tripled, and we're expecting that you know in the next ten years, our total vehicle sales are actually going to go up to about you know two hundred odd million. And what's really interesting is where EVs come into picture is the fact that in India, roads carry ninety percent of you know of the modal share. So the average of freight and passengers would be about ninety percent. And out of these fourteen percent contributions that come from the transport sector, ninety percent of them actually come from the road sector. And as is the case globally, India is witnessing rapid urbanization. Uh, you know, UN uh, data estimates say that, you know, Delhi might end up becoming one of the most populous cities. So what we also see is an urban sprawl. So, you know, the number of vehicles also increase. And given that road sector is such a big contributor, there's of course a need uh, to, you know, take measures towards, uh, uh, you know, decarbonization. And of course, the, the, the recent uh, example, which everybody would be able to relate to, or the recent development rather, is COVID-19, because what it has done is that it has made people kind of shift away uh, from public transport, uh, you know, towards private modes of transport, which is, I mean, it's, it's a worrying trend, but it also brings, uh, you know, an opportunity. Uh, but, you know, just to say that electric vehicles are, of course, a very important part of, you know, of, of you know, ushering mobility, which is sort of clean and, you know, uh, you know connected. But the government of India has also taken a number of other measures across sectors because EV is one part of you know your ability to decarbonize transport sector. 
Uh, so, you know, we've come up with a vehicle strapping policy. We've come up with 11 committees to, you know, drive circular economy in various areas. Uh, we've come, uh, you know, we've, we have the FAME policy, which is specific to electric vehicles, which I'll come to in the next slide. Uh, you know, we have the national urban transport policy, which actually, you know, talks about creating a, which also talks about creating a, you know, unified metropolitan transport agency. And which is really important is because as Steffi was saying that we also need to talk about, you know, compact cities, urban sprawl, you know, mixed land use. And all of this is only possible when you're able to bring together different agencies, whether they're municipal or transport together. And, you know, that's why this policy is important. So, of course, uh, these are a lot of different initiatives, but I think... Uh, I would use this to actually talk about the EV ecosystem in India. So what we see over here is that between 1981 and 2011, uh, there was a 77% increase in the population of India. But if you look at uh, the increase in the number of motor vehicles, uh, you know, they grew by almost 2,500%, which is, which is a huge number, right? Um, and so what we're trying to say now is that because this growth is so phenomenal, but despite this growth, if we look at the number of cars per million population, what we actually see is that while the US would have about 837 cars per 1,000 people, uh, you know, uh, in India, this is just about 22 cars per 1,000 population. And that's kind of interesting because, you know, then you actually have a huge opportunity to replace whatever addition is going to happen in the number of vehicles by, you know, mobility, which is kind of clean. And that's where electric vehicles sort of, uh, you know, sort of really come into, uh, you know, sort of really come into the picture. Uh, then what we see is, uh, if you look at the graph in yellow, this talks about the two-wheeler sales. Uh, and as you can see, they've, they've been constantly growing. So electric two-wheelers, by the way, the most popular forms of electric mobility in India, and we are seeing a constant upward growth. And in fact, it is projected by 2030, you might see about 24 million, uh, you know, registered, uh, you know, electric two wheelers uh, on, on, on the roads. And the kind of phenomenal growth that we are witnessing is that between 2015 and 2020, if you look at the uptake of electric mobility, and we are, uh, we are talking about the overall EV sales, which also includes four wheelers, two wheelers, we, we've seen, you know, a CAGR of 133%. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's really interesting. Now, what has, what has really led to this is where our policy instruments come, uh, you know, into the picture. So we have something known as, uh, you know, the FAME policy. So the FAME policy stands for the faster adoption and manufacturing of electric and uh, you know hybrid vehicles, right? So FAME two policy. There were two versions of this. This is the second version. It actually supports electrification of public and shared transportation, and it aims to subsidize about seven thousand electric buses, about five hundred thousand electric three wheelers, about fifty five thousand four wheelers, uh, you know about a million two wheelers, and about four thousand you know charging stations, right? And this is the subsidy that actually gets passed on. This is actually the subsidy which is provided to the original equipment manufacturers. And that's important because they sort of then pass it on, uh, you know, to the end user or the consumer or the buyers of these electric vehicles. Uh, and if you look at what has been, what has been availed out of the subsidies that we are actually providing to the manufacturers about, you know, the subsidy has already been availed out of the 7,000 available for e-buses for about 6,265. Uh, about 15,000 three-wheelers, uh, 1540 four-wheelers. Uh, that's really interesting. You know, if we look at the four-wheelers there, we see that it's available for 55,000, but it's availed, it's been availed only for 1,540. And, and the reason for this is that this has been made available, uh, you know, only for uh, the four-wheelers, which are going to be used in shared mobility or, you know, uh, uh, and, and I think that's what's not allowing private car manufacturers to avail this. So this is something that's been considered. Uh, and this will feed back into the probably the next time the policy is revised. Uh, and similarly, about 57,000 electric two-wheelers have also availed this. So, so FAME has two components. One, of course, is the subsidy component, and the other is something which is known as the phased manufacturing program. Now, what's also important for India as a country is to start manufacturing components which are used for electric vehicles. And so what we did was that we introduced something known as the phased manufacturing program, where we've actually incentivized the manufacture of low value, 
EV accessories by increasing the basic customs duty on these smaller components, which are actually being imported. So in that way, it gives a greater incentive for you know more number of local manufacturers to actually start uh, manufacturing them. And over time, we aim to you know go from the production of these low cost components to high cost components, and that is happening through something known as the production linked incentive scheme, which the government has recently launched. And I will come to that in just a second. But before that, what are the other policy instruments that other ministries have have deployed? Right. So we have the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. What they've done is they've and since we are a federal structure, we cannot as the central government, we cannot force the state governments to do something. But what we can do is to, you know, issue advisories to them. And what we've told them is that you should really exempt, uh, you know, the road tax on electric vehicles. You should exempt battery operated vehicles from, you know, paying the registration fees in that particular state. Uh, uh, we have actually come up with a notification on sale of vehicles without batteries. So that's that's a new notification which has been launched so that the consumer can actually understand that what differential in cost is actually being brought about by the battery itself. Because we also want to give, uh, you know, kind of an impetus to the battery swapping industry in India. So we've actually now, we actually now have a notification where it's not mandatory for a consumer to actually purchase an electric vehicle with a battery. They can actually produce uh, uh, sorry, procure a battery, uh, you know, separately. Uh, we've also looked at, uh, MORTH has also come up with the deregistration and scrapping of government old vehicles, which are old. And we are also considering the imposition of a green tax where vehicles older than eight years might be asked, uh, you know, to pay a green tax. Then if you look at the measures which have been brought about by the Ministry of Finance, the goods and services tax, uh, which consumers are liable to pay, on electric vehicles, this rate was originally 12%, but in order to sort of boost the uptake, this was brought down from 12% uh, to 5%. Uh, the same tax on the EV chargers, which was earlier at 18%, was then brought down to 5%. Uh, then you were also given tax deductions on the interest paid on loans to purchase electric vehicles up to USD 1500. And if you are a private company or a government agency which is hiring electric buses for the transport of your employees or whosoever it might be, uh, you are now exempt from, you know, from paying tax on that. Uh, if you look at the Housing and Urban Affairs Ministry and city planning, of course, is an integral concept. I have not touched upon it much. I, I, in fact, I haven't touched upon it in my presentation, but that, of course, is very integral to ushering any kind of uh, you know, mobility that we might have. So what we see is the amendments to the model building bylaws, which have been brought about by Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. Now it's for states and urban local bodies to kind of, uh, you know, notify them and why these bylaws, why these changes have been brought so that there is provision in office buildings, in commercial buildings, in residential buildings to allow for installation of, you know, electric vehicle chargers by default. So, for example, our bylaws would state something like, okay, if your house is four floors and if you to make that house, you man, you need to have a parking that's built. Similarly, now the bylaws actually say that you need to have provisions for, uh, you know, charging points for electric vehicles. Similarly, Ministry of Power has, you know, issued a number of notifications. Uh, they've actually defined what these electric vehicle components are, uh, you know, uh, so that there's a level playing field between EV manufacturers and manufacturers of, uh, you know, you know, uh, manufacture, other manufacturers, right? Uh, because earlier, before this whole EV concept came in, there was not a very clear definition. What exactly is an EV charger? What exactly is charging infrastructure? So I think that definition was very important so that you provide a level playing field for the people who are actually, or the companies rather, who are actually, uh, you know, sort of manufacturing these. Um, and the Ministry of Environment, in fact, has drafted a notification on battery waste management which is very important from a, for, for an urban mining perspective, because as your EVs go up, the you know demand for batteries would also go up. So there is a certain value extraction that you have to do from the batteries, which also you know brings down, ultimately would bring down production costs and also uh, does away with the resource scarcity that we have in terms of you know lithium and cobalt. Uh, in terms of what our role is as the National Institution for Transforming India, uh, or NITI, which is the uh, ministry that I represent over here. So we at NITI, we realized that because there are so many different ministries, and this would be a problem that uh, you know the, the, the participants of various other countries also might be facing, is that 
there, there's a lot of different agencies, you know, so the charging infrastructure for us, it's Ministry of Power, which is looking at it. If it's manufacturing of batteries or vehicles, it's Department of Heavy Industries. If it's bylaws, it's Housing and Urban, it's, you know, Urban Development Ministry. So I think somewhere there was a need that there should be one agency which should bring together and galvanize the efforts of all, all of these different stakeholders. And that's where we created the National Mission on Transformative Mobility and Battery Storage. And we have actually been working with different states to actually help them come up with their EV policies. So, by the way, India does not have a central EV policy, but it's actually the state governments which are, you know, coming up with their own EV policies. And as Niti Aayog, we've actually been helping them come up and draft these state policies. And so far, 22 governments have already, you know, come up with, 22 state governments have already come up with their policies. Uh, we help the states and union and our territories, you know, undertake capacity building exercises. We have frequent interactions with them. You know, we bring in, uh, you know, best practices. We, we are working on model concessionaire agreements for deployment of electric buses to an operating expense model. Uh, you know, uh, we got the charging standards notified. Uh, you know, we're running campaigns to encourage e-mobility uptake. And now we have actually formed 11 different committees to look at circular economy across a number of areas. And one of them, of course, is the recycling of batteries. And that, of course, is very important, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the kind of EV uptake in India that is required. What we also have on uh, the, so what we've done so far, or what I was talking about so far, are measures which are related to the demand side of things. But it's also important to look at, you know, the supply side of things. So India very recently launched a, uh, production linked incentive schemes, I believe across, uh, you know, 17 or 18 different sectors, whether it's telecom, pharmaceutical, automobiles, solar energy. The idea was that we want to bring in more manufacturers into the country and we want to encourage them to set up manufacturing units across area. And so we came up with something very unique. We said that we will have something known as the production linked incentive scheme where whatever you produce, and if you meet certain production targets, you will actually be given a monetary incentive to actually produce those number of units or that class of units. So what we have, uh, which pertains directly to EV, is the PLI scheme for ACC battery storage, which is the advanced cell chemistry battery storage. And this scheme has a total outlay of about 2.5 billion USD. And what we want is that, you know, through a competitive bidding process, we will uh, actually select manufacturers who would then be required to set up uh, a minimum of, you know, five gigawatt hour capacity, uh, you know, uh, battery manufacturing units and ensure that there is at least a 60% value addition uh, within five years, uh, you know, from setting up your manufacturing units. And this kind of incentive will be paid out, you know, on the basis of your sales, energy efficiency, battery life cycle, and, you know, there's a number of other parameters which are there uh, in, in, in the bidding process and the scheme guidelines. And we expect that as a result of this, about 5.9 billion USD worth of direct investment is going to come in. And it's also going to save us about 33 billion USD in terms of, you know, uh, reduction of, uh, you know, oil import bill. Similarly, the other production linked incentive scheme, which was just launched a couple of months ago and which has, uh, which has uh, an outlay of 3.5 billion USD, uh, is the scheme to incentivize uh, electric vehicle and fuel cell EV manufacturing or the auto and automobile components. So what we've done as a result of this, we've covered charging ports, drive trains, you know, electric vacuum pumps, compressors, flex fuel kits, hydrogen cell fuel kits. Uh, and ICE engine vehicles, of course, uh, you know, some parts, but at least 90% of this subsidy is specifically encouraging uh, the production of electric vehicles in the country, which is, which is uh, you know, which is really interesting. Uh, what we also launched uh, is uh, something known as the vehicle scrapping policy. And what we've done is that now all old vehicles will have to pass a fitness test, you know, before they want re-registration. And what we've done is that while we have not directly taxed, you know, while we've not directly taxed such vehicles, you know, because that would have led to a lot of animosity from the traditional ice industry or just the players, but we've, you know, spun it in a slightly different way. What we've said is that if you want to renew your license after 15 years, right, we've increased the amount of registration fee that you will have to pay for it. 
And similarly, if you're actually, you know, kind of deregistering your vehicle, which is older than 15 years, if you're getting it scrapped, right, then what we do is that we have told the vehicle manufacturers to give you a discount of 5% uh, on the total sale of the new vehicle that you are purchasing. And the registration fees will also be waived off on the purchase of this new vehicle. So there is an incentive and there is also a discipline. And of course, this will go a long way in promoting the uptake of electric vehicles, but also in terms of reduction of emission and also giving, you know, providing the impetus for the, you know, evolution of a local scrap industry, uh, you know, vehicle scrapping industry in the country. As I said, at the central level, we've taken a number of measures to incentivize the demand side and the supply side. And this is applicable throughout the country. So, you, you know, you cannot have a state government saying that we have not received benefits because these schemes are applicable across the country. But over and above this, what we see is certain very proactive states of India, which have announced incentives over and above what the central government already has to sort of offer them. So for example, the Indian state of Andhra Pradesh, they've talked about, they've said that they will provide reimbursements on the state goods and services tax. They will provide a waiver on electricity duty for five years. They will provide you a financial incentive assistance or rather share 50% of your cost of fixed capital investment on EV manufacturing. Uh, similarly, let's say the state of Uttar Pradesh, which happens to be India's most populous state, they've announced the capital interest subsidy, infrastructure interest that subsidy, reimbursement of you know the goods and services tax. So states are mostly coming up with measures which are supply side as, as they would be expected to. And as you can see on the map on your right, about 22 uh, of our states have actually announced their electric vehicle policies. Uh, and I think why states are also happy to do this is because they realize that all of them are anyway benefiting from the central assistance because, you know, the central assistance does, or the subsidies do not discriminate between states. So it's, it's for them. And we've been encouraging them that, you know, I mean, electric vehicles are going to be a big thing in India over the next few years. So you know, you should jump in to, you know, join in, you know, and we will provide you any help possible, whether it's framing your EV policies, learning from the best practices, uh, so on and so forth. And just to end, just to leave you with, uh, you know, a couple of pictures, if you actually come to India or if you actually come to Delhi, you would see that just from a couple of years before, there's a massive difference. You know, you would find charging infrastructure in any major market. Uh, you know, you would see it in housing societies. In fact, you would see, uh, you know, charging infrastructure installed outside people's houses. So it's something that's catching up on, you know, very quickly. And we've seen people coming up with, you know, rather, you know, unique solutions. So now there are agencies which have actually converted, uh, you know, the junction boxes of lampposts where you could actually connect and charge your, uh, you know, electric vehicle, which is the picture that you see on your, uh, you know, on your right picture in pink. So we've got really interesting solutions like that coming up. Uh, you know, in the country. And we expect that this will only grow further. But one of the challenges that we see is that uh, this, this development is also slightly happens out with different agencies jumping in to do things that, uh, you know, uh, and not coordinating these efforts, which is why it's very important, uh, you know, to have coordinated efforts across the entire renewability spectrum. And E2, and as you see a scooter parked in the first picture, their electric two-wheeler sales, in fact, Ola Electric just launched uh, two variants of their, uh, you know, uh, electric scooter. And in 24 hours, uh, you know, they received 100,000 bookings. Uh, that's just in 24 hours. So, uh, I mean, imagine the kind of interest that, that there's there uh, for mobility, uh, which is electric um, in certain Indian cities as of now. And what we've also seen is the emergence of a lot of startups, uh, you know, Aether Energy, uh, you know, these are all startups. I mean, the first, uh, you know, eight uh, logos that you see up there are all startups, uh, which have actually cropped up and they're actually doing really well. And of course, there's a bigger manufacturers also, uh, which are producing their electric vehicles. Uh, so I think that's, that's from my end, a brief overview of, you know, the electric mobility ecosystem, um, you know, in, in India and what are the policy instruments uh, that we've been able to deploy so far. And, you know, going forward, of course, there are a number of challenges, but I think going forward, the key would be to integrate efforts across state level, urban local body level and national level, uh, and also kind of integrate electric vehicles and shared mobility with the public transport network, because until and unless you have that planning, uh, you will only see, you know, development, which is kind of haphazard and which doesn't really serve the purpose of mobility, which is truly 
uh, you know, sort of free. So uh, from my end, uh, that is it. So we just heard from Siddharth Sinha, uh, uh, the India example, and Siddharth actually joined us in previous CT sessions and, and thus the pre-recording uh, for the CT, for the other, uh, for the use of other CTs. So we had him in both, I believe, the Asia-wide regional training back in October, and we also had him in the Hanoi uh, last week. And uh, he is representing the National Institution for Transforming India, or Niti Ayog. So in terms of um, exploring the policy tools at local level, uh, how that fits and align with the national um, that has been, I would say, an interesting area, an interesting case to study. So at some point, I believe we will, uh, through the leadership of passive transport, we will be able to explore uh, similar measures like the one that he touched on was the building codes, uh, even if it's uh, also, I believe, at national level in the Philippines, perhaps the, uh, the way that permits are given, etc., could also be elaborated at city level. And those are the types of uh, untapped opportunities that we could uh, work together on. Um, at some point, we will also discuss with other uh, national agencies, uh, the likes of, uh, I believe, the Department of Interior and Local Government. Uh, they have been invited, but unfortunately are not available uh, uh, today, but we will be communicating the outcomes uh, from these sessions to them as we are continuing the collaboration and the cooperation with them. Um, so we heard also uh, in India, uh, state uh, governments are the ones that are crafting EV policies and a lot of uh, uh, cooperation are uh, being uh, exercised in that arena and including the capacity building exercise. And that's also one of our objectives in these sessions. So while the presentation is loading, so the actually the, the coverage of the uh, the Land Transportation Office uh, administrative, administrative order, uh, it's, it's covering both the recording and the registration. So there has been some discussions about the safety. And I believe back in 2019, when we had this discussion, when we heard LTO presenting the, one of the draft versions then, um, they have also reached out to the different LTO district heads, different district offices, and there was a, a general uh, call to, you know, we should really push for ensuring the safety. So perhaps some of these should only be allowed on private roads or subdivisions. Um, but yeah, so let's have a look at that, what the regulations are. If you this is the first time that you will hear it, uh, please also let us know if you have questions and clarifications, uh, if there are not, uh, if there are certain provisions that is not that, that are not so clear. Uh, so maybe next to well, next slide. Yeah, so this is the administrative order and we can also circulate that and share that with you uh, via email. So we also have your uh, contact details uh, from the registration so we can also disseminate this. Uh, next slide. So the scope of the administrative order is on the classification, registration and the operation of uh, EVs. So, um, Generally, the, the vehicles that are covered include the personal mobility scooters, uh, electric, uh, electric kick scooters, um, the L category L, um, which is what we're going to really touch on this uh, today. And we also have M1, M2, M3 categories, which are the e-cars, e-jeeps, uh, e-buses. And then uh, we also have category N, which are e-trucks. So uh, next just click one. Uh, so that's going to be the scope of our discussion. We'll zoom in on the uh, two and three pillars. Um, next slide. So um, we get to it already on the, the categories of EV. So let's start off with the uh, um, sections three and 3.1 and 3.2 basically of, of the, the order of the AO. And for personal mobility scooter and electric kick scooter, um, they are, uh, according to the law, according to the, the regulation, um, they are allowed only on, on private roads and walkways, the personal mobility scooter. So that is uh, the image on the left side. And uh, those are with a maximum speed of uh, 12. 
0.5 kph so they're not allowed to uh, they're not required to be registered or recorded um no age limit and no license required for that uh, and on the other hand we also uh, the the order also has um um, provisions for electric kick scooter, which are also just allowed on private or barangay roads. Um, I believe that would also be um, uh, subdivisions, uh, so not going further to the local roads. Uh, as an LG, you are probably most uh, more familiar with the classification of roads. Um, and so you're more able to follow this discussion, uh, hopefully. But uh, if you have questions also, uh, we can also clarify that by the chat box. Um, and we can also set up a, a more deep, a deeper dive with, with LTO. No? So and now the L category are what we call now the e-bikes, uh, e-mopeds, or uh, electric two-wheelers. So with or without pedals, uh, with speed ranging from 25 uh, kilometers per hour uh, to 50 kilometers per hour. So they're allowed on private and barangay roads. Um, and also local roads for the L1B category, uh, provided that they use the outermost part closest to the edge, close, closest to the edge of the, the road. So that is according to the, the AO. Uh, for that, only recording is required, so not registration. Um, so meaning the dri driver's license registrations are both not required. Uh, so for safety reasons, they have also uh, you you will also notice the the difference in the helmet requirements. So it's a bicycle helmet and the uh, motorcycle helmet. Uh, next slide uh, for the L two A and the L two B, which are the e moped uh, three wheelers. So let's go first to the L two A. These are like the the three wheeler with or without pedals, maximum speed of 25 kph. The operation is rather the same and the registration is also not required. So only recording. It can pass through uh, main thoroughfares, so national or, or national roads for the purpose of cr crossing only. On the other hand, the L2B category the three wheels with the maximum speed of 50 kph the operation may go beyond private roads up to the local roads, provided that uh, the outermost part of the road close to the edge uh, are going to be used only. So it also can pass through main thoroughfares, uh, but only for crossing purposes. So uh, for this one, registration is already required um, and hence the driver's license. So uh, you would recall, um, uh, we didn't have a chance to compare this side by side with uh, uh, this, the presentation earlier of Verizon of, of Bird on the, the ASEAN recommendations, but uh, perhaps that's something we can do after and see where, where are we missing uh, on the, what are we missing in the regulations, yeah? Uh, next slide. And the L3, so these are now the electric motorcycles. Uh, it's the same rather as conventional ones. So they are allowed in private roads, national roads, um, except in limited access highways, okay? So normally the speeds there are faster. So all should have valid motorcycle driver licenses, and this is now can this now can be used for uh, public transport use as opposed to the ones prior, I believe. Okay. Uh, next slide. For the L four and L five, which are the e trikes uh, or electric three wheelers, no? so. Uh, they may be allowed, so L4 and L5, they may be allowed to go beyond local roads. However, concerned LGUs can authorize uh, these types of EVs, uh, whether they're private or for hire, to, to use the national highways or the main thoroughfares. But that will be subject to an ordinance 
and will be constrained to the outermost uh, lane of the highway. So same as before, it's prohibited uh, along limited access highways um, as according to the stipulations. So um, from a presentation of, of LTO it, back in 2019, um, they also mentioned that like, if you look at the, the provinces in the Philippines, uh, there are really no alternate routes to national highways. So uh, LTO is really allowing the LGUs to decide on this matter, you know, to issue the suitable ordinances for especially the ATREX. And so you would see in some uh, provinces, perhaps some of you who are coming outside of Metro Manila might be familiar with this scenario. Um, so that is one of the considerations that they had in uh, developing it as such. So the drivers now then uh, must bear a driver's license and similar to the motor tricycle that we see now, helmet is uh, not uh, required for e-trikes. So, um, so actually for the L6 and 7, maybe uh, go back up one slide. Uh, I forgot to cover this. So for the L6 and 7, these are the e-quad recycles or, or e-quads with the maximum sp <clears throat> speed of uh, 50 kph. Uh, these can pass through um, main thoroughfares for crossing only uh, when the road, um, for crossing, yeah, I think, yeah, for crossing only. So concerned LGUs can also authorize these types, whether for private or for hire, uh, to traverse the national highways or the main thoroughfares, but that, that has to be subject to an ordinance. Uh, they can only allow it through an ordinance and should only be, and but will only be constrained to the outermost uh, uh, lane of the highway. So all of these that are shown on the screen are also prohibited uh, along limited access highways. Um, and these may be used for public transport. So um, I wonder, so this is probably the first time for some of the participants to you know, have a good look at the different uh, L category regulations. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I believe that will be a summary of the uh, the smaller modes up to the L category. Uh, we no longer touched on the, the category M and N in this uh, presentation, uh, but we are happy to just share with you the, the file from the LTO that's been released already, uh, I think earlier this year, first half of this year. Um, so this shows the comparison or the, the summary for the smaller modes of, uh, of EVs. So, we can go back again later to this slide, uh, but you would see here uh, how some of the regulations now would uh, require uh, the recording um, of the EVs uh, and from what category now the LDO is requiring, requiring the registration uh, of the uh, category L EVs. Um, age limit. Uh, I believe um, this is something that we can probably uh, talk a little bit more with, uh, discuss a bit, a bit more with the national government. Um, I, it's not uh, explained. I would say that the entire um, uh, public transport use, the license, the age limit, etc. Are, are not fully elaborated there. Uh, but I believe further provisions or further uh, iterations of that would probably come in uh, soon, but we, would, we can check with the LTO on that. So we have also put in another slide, I think that comes next, uh, the image, uh, at least the, the registration, the re regulation, and also the motor vehicle research charge. So this shows again the registration regulations, and I believe there are there have been some questions coming from the different local government units, at least from uh, our consultations from you know from other projects, etc. But our conversations that we had with other LGUs, there is a need for to clarify what then would the uh, the LGU role be in terms of recording uh, this smaller modes of transport and the data the types of data and information that will be collected, etc. So those are some discussion points that can be had afterwards. So um, 
three more slides after this, I believe, are more relevant for the manufacturers, assemblers, and importers. So we can probably skip that uh, in the interest of time. Um, so yeah, maybe I can uh, skip these parts already. So th that is the overview of the Land Transportation Office Administrative Order. Uh, and yeah, I, presenting that on behalf of LTO. And if you have clarifications, I believe we can also um, have a bit of discussion on that. If there are none, then we can um, disseminate the regulations and perhaps have a bit more dialogue with different LGUs on this. Uh, I'll present a bit on the, the land transport office, land transportation office guidelines. Um, uh, Nash book, uh, could you kindly load the? So, uh, no, uh, actually, I think we could first have a survey on this one. I believe we have ready one or two slides on that. Uh, we just want to get a better understanding of how it's also perceived in general. And for those who are joining us today and this afternoon, uh, whether you're coming from uh, Pasig or not, could you give us an insight on how well you know the local regulations pertaining to the registration requirements? Um, I guess in also in your city, are you familiar with the operational requirements, uh, with the operation, operational use, etc.? So uh, actually, when we, the consultations on that, uh, we have been part of some of those discussions before. And actually, there, we have an existing guidelines uh, dating back from 2006, I believe. And in 2009, uh, also, then uh, each right, I believe, also back in 2015. And the goal of this recent uh, Land Transportation Office administrative order um, is to consolidate uh, these guidelines that have been issued in the past. So we will give an overview of that and see uh, if there are further challenges and if there are questions on this. And perhaps one of the follow-up activities coming out of this training and discussion uh, would be to uh, somehow dive deeper into the, the Philippine cities and the, the, the land transportation office uh, regulations. So could we now open the floor for uh, questions? If there are questions also coming out of the from the PASIC side, um, that would also be most welcome. If you're coming from a different LGU and have questions also and clarifications uh, or challenges, uh, we could also uh, uh, entertain that, of course. Uh, and while you're Thinking about that, um, perhaps we can have this other poll and other survey that we have prepared. So this is a more open-ended question uh, coming out as perhaps a word cloud, Nash, I'm not quite sure, but I think it could come out as a, uh, as a list of the questions that you still have after having heard all the presentations today and after hearing the Land Transportation Office AO. Um, what were the areas, um, what are the areas in regulations in general or policy tools at local level um, that need clarification? Um, or what are the challenges that you face, you anticipate facing, have faced uh, uh, in the past uh, on the implementation side? So uh, this will be, anonymous in terms of like uh, when we flash the, the questions there. And this will also help us um, shape the dialogues that we can develop together with the Plastic Transport Office in terms of how do we now foster the policies, uh, the, the use of EVs, especially smaller modes of EVs at the local level um, uh, and, and explore what are their suitable policy tools. So uh, one question in the chat box, 
uh, from Arnold. Hello. Uh, I believe we also had you uh, join us yesterday. Uh, thank you for joining us today again. So the question is, uh, the requirement for kick scooters uh, to be used only on private and barangay roads is quite regressive. Uh, it can be a major means of, yes, indeed, mobility for workers. And I see it regularly in the bike lanes in Commonwealth and other major thoroughfares. thoroughfares. Uh, were there any pushback on these during the consultation? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have not been a part of the extensive consultation that LTO conducted. So we have, I think I was able to join one of the sessions um, back in 2019. So that was um, a year, even more than a year before the, the issuance of the AO. No? So um, I, after it was issued, I believe we saw, I remember we saw a couple of news from July to August uh, regarding the pushback coming from different um users actually themselves. So uh, in one of the cities in Metro Manila, um, they implemented these, uh, the, the AO already. And, um, and the traffic enforcers, um, I think they gave them tickets for, uh, yeah, I think they, they for the e-bikes and e-scooters, they also got tickets for that. And that quite uh, received some uh, pushback and resistance. And, you know, a lot of CSOs are now wondering uh, had there been an extensive consultation, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I believe this is something that can be discussed further because uh, during the time that uh, LTO was consulting a lot of agencies, no? so they were very welcoming of the questions and of the suggestions, um, even coming from CSOs and from different um, entities. I think from Cleaner Asia, uh, we gathered some from um, uh, from international agencies also and from LGUs and th there was also a draft version of uh, of that one that, that was a, a little bit more welcoming so perhaps there has been some um, uh, I believe somewhere in the middle no baka um, na adopt lang na, na, na statement the provisions that has uh, dami ng pumapasok na comments and suggestions. So, so perhaps there's some confusion on that. And we can check that further on this one. But uh, I'm happy to uh, continue this discussion also uh, after the session. So we can consult uh, definitely LTO on that one. So, so we have no other uh, questions coming out of the poll. Um, so uh, in the interest of time, we can already uh, close the poll first for now. I believe there should be, there would be, um, ah, okay, so there is a question here. Uh, has there been discussions with uh, LTO where the LGU can override the implementation of AO? Can they issue a local policy and that can override some of the provisions of the aforementioned LTO? A very good question, uh, but unfortunately, uh, an area that we would like to also uh, defer to LTO no, on this matter. So they have purview over this uh, issue. So unfortunately, this is not an area that we can conf confidently answer. Uh, but this is something we can check with the likes of LTO and perhaps the ALG can advise us on uh, this uh, this these matters, no, and um, perhaps also um, the there's there could be some discussions also surrounding the uh, the cycling infrastructure that will have to be built because a lot of them are really uh, moving moving them towards the outer mostly, no. So potentially the the direction here might be you know really pushing uh, the, the local government units into. Um, providing or building the infrastructure, investing in this infrastructure. So um, I believe we can uh, reach out to LTO to get an, uh, some clarity on this question. We would like to uh, invite everybody again tomorrow. Unfortunately, it's already five and I believe that is all the time that we have for today. So, um, give me a second. Ah, okay, so this is uh, already on the screen. Bala. So, uh, next slide. Um, so, 
join us again tomorrow. So tomorrow, uh, you will be joined by Alvin Mejia from Wuppertal Institute. You heard him also earlier to pre uh, presenting the policy tools for local authorities. Now, so tomorrow, he will guide you through the session as your moderator. And um, once again, I'm Kathleen. And uh, on behalf of Solutions Plus, I'm very pleased to meet you all and interact with you today. And thank you all again uh, to our, speak our contributors and speakers. Dr. Horizon, Alvin, uh, Bert, uh, I believe had already left. Um, but thank you so much. And uh, we also have in the session, uh, PASI Transport Office. They're also joining us um, throughout the session. So um, yes, yeah, so this is the one that we are um, anticipating uh, to join us tomorrow. So tomorrow it's going to be about the EV charging. Uh, we will hear from Dr. Manny Biona. Um, to talk about the charging types and standards and the Philippine setting. We'll have Vittorio Ravello for the technical prerequisites demand and the considerations for EV charging. Uh, we'll also have Ms. Dang Tirante from Get Philippines um, to uh, brief us on the how do we ensure safe charging and um, a bit of um, uh, experience from the case study you know, from the Philippines. We'll also have Dr. Ture from uh, National Chiang Kong University. Uh, and yung experience sila on the charging infrastructure development uh, and deployment rather. Uh, we'll also have Dr. Nuong um, for yung, uh, and yung case study naman sa Thailand and what and yung mga naging role ng government to on in um, developing or setting up the EV charging. And so that will be moderated by Alvin. So with that, um, thank you again for joining us today and good evening and see you tomorrow.